God. And I was like, wow, we thought Zoom was a new thing, right? But it is possible for the Holy Spirit to go through the airwaves. We don't even have to be all together as much as I love that. And I wish we could like, wow, we thought Zoom was a new thing. Praise God. So even as you hear the word that is coming across today, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will touch you right there in your living room, in your space, in your car, wherever you're joining from, from all around the world. We know there are people from Nigeria, from America, from the UK, from Canada, wherever you are, as you hear the sound of the words that will be spoken today. God will begin to minister to that deep need inside of you and the Holy Spirit will come down right there in your living space. I'm telling you, I was one that had to struggle with uh, uh, doing phone prayer meetings or virtual meetings until one day while I was praying on the phone with some sisters right in my closet where I was praying. You know, when the Bible says that the ground where they prayed shook, the anointing came down and I was like, wow. So I'm telling you, this is real. Just, just connect with what God is doing and be present. And God is going to answer some questions that you have been asking for a long time, regardless, you know, of time and space. So the subject before us today is the complete woman the complete woman. And the question is, what does it mean to be complete? What does it mean to be a complete woman? And um, I did go up to look at the dictionary meaning of the word complete. And it says to be complete means to have all the necessary or appropriate parts nothing missing. Sister Elsa is helping me, you know, with the presentation and slides. And uh, I thank God for the grace upon her to do this. To be complete means to have all the necessary parts, nothing missing. Sister Elsa, can you show that? To be free from deficiency, that is what it means to be complete to have all the necessary parts. Just pause and think about that for a minute. Nothing missing, free from deficiency. Think about that just for a minute. What would that mean to you? To say you are free from deficiency, you have everything you need. Think about it. Who is a complete woman? Who is a complete woman? In the light of that definition, we can say a complete woman is a woman that is not lacking in any sphere of life. In any sphere of life. And, and um, so we begin to, to look at what are the spheres of life. And here is a vertical presentation of the spheres of life. I wish that we could say it's as easy as faith, family, and friends. Just those three simple blocks, but it's much more complicated than that. We have the family and the home life, and this is not presented in any particular order, except maybe you can say alphabetically, and I deliberately presented it that way. Faith, family, I mean, family and home, your finance, your financial life, your career, your mental health, education. You know, that's where we talk about going to school, getting educated, degrees, your physical life, your health, then the social and the cultural aspects of life, the spiritual, the ethical. You know, and there are many aspects of your life that are not captured in this uh, presentation right here. And, and I have it under there. You fill it in. So it is quite complicated in different spheres, yet we want to be complete in every of these areas. And this vertical presentation is what most of us do for a long time or what we are used to. And then we begin to hear things like, 
put God first. So we move the spiritual to the top. And people say, you know, put God first and then your family and then your career. So you're trying to arrange these things and, you know, check the boxes. Yes, I have done this. For some people, putting God first means when you wake up in the morning, make sure you say a prayer, make sure you have a quiet time and then go about your activities for the day. For some others, it means make sure you go to church on Sunday, start the week with God. You know, you check the box and then you can now go about your activities. So that's the vertical presentation. It's more like a checkbox approach. You know, when I think of this, I think of the rich young ruler who came to meet Jesus and said, uh, what do I need to do to be saved? He said, I've done this, done this, done that. I pay my tithe. I give to the poor. You know, I've done this, done this, done that. What else do I need to do to be complete? So people set out and, and, and they take these issues of life one after the other. That is the vertical approach. So Elsa, if you will help us, let's take a look at another approach. That's a secular approach with you in the middle. Now just take a look at this. You are right there in the center. So this is a little different from the vertical approach. You're trying to accomplish all of these things at the same time. You're trying to accomplish all of these things at the same time. So here you are in the middle. This is where we begin to talk about role conflict. The same woman, you know, you're trying to, you're married, you're trying to raise a family. You have young children. You know, at the beginning, our sister told us while she is yet nursing, the, the call of ministry is pulling upon her, the call of purpose reaching out to women. So she has her baby by the side. She said, you will excuse me because at some point I might have to stop and attend to the baby. You know, I read something some months ago, very touching about a woman who was desperate to pursue her career dreams. And then she had to go for an interview and she, she was a nursing mother. And this big executive who was interviewing her, she said, my heart went out to her because right in the middle of trying to make a good impression on your prospective employer, there goes the baby crying. And she's torn in two as a mother. She had to beg the man, please, can I attend to her? And being the understanding man that he was, he said, feel free, go ahead, nurse your baby, I'll wait. So we find ourselves in that kind of conflict. I cannot even begin to tell you that as a woman, I am drawn in many places. I am a wife. I am a mother, I am a daughter, I am a career person, I am drawn in ministry. I mean, so many different areas, yet I have to pay attention to my physical health. You know, I have to find time for exercise. I have to relate socially. I have to do all of these things. And I still want to spend more time with my creator. So you find that we are drawn in all of these places and it becomes very, very demanding as a woman. How am I supposed to manage all of this and find completion in Christ? And so you find there's a lot of people who go out searching, searching for completion, searching. I want to talk a little bit about the search for completeness. The search for completeness. If Sister Elsa will help us, we'll go to that slide. The search for completeness. I tell you, this search has taken people in so many different directions. The search for completeness. It depends on what they have understood will complete them. Now, like I was saying, some people feel completion comes to them through career and educational accomplishment. So they set out to accomplish that. They get one degree after the other. And these women are usually very determined. They are purposeful. They are, 
purpose-driven, goal-oriented. They want to make it to the top of their careers. And you find that, that while trying to do that, many other aspects of their lives may suffer, like Sister Elsa said at the beginning. You know, but it becomes very sad if after you have pursued all of these things, you suddenly find that you do not feel complete. I was in a conference one time and a sister spoke. She said in her quest for completeness or to feel that she had arrived, I mean, it was phrased differently, but the same thing. She went after, that's when you find somebody, MMR, MSN, PPL, whatever the letters are, you are putting behind your name. Sometimes you do one master's degree, you go ahead, you do another one, you have a PhD. She said she was one of those girls who grew up in the project and she felt she needed to make a statement that I can be somebody. So she went after academic pursuits and getting degrees. And at a point she felt that she had reached the peak of her career. Yet when she's in a boardroom, with other directors or leaders, she was working in a very big organization. She would come to the meeting feeling empty, feeling incomplete, feeling like she did not belong. She said, even though I had more degrees than a thermometer, I still felt inadequate, not enough. So for some people that is their plight. And it took another woman with discernment in that same organization to call her out and tell her sister, you are qualified to sit at this table because she felt inadequate in herself. I will just stop that there for now and take a look at women who think their completeness is in their physical appearance. You can't even begin to imagine the extent to which some women would go. You know, thank God for, for new innovations and plastic surgeries and cosmetologies and manicures and pedicures and all of that. And, and uh, for wigs and for clothes and people get designers shoes and bags just to make themselves feel good. There are many people who get breast implants, cosmetic breast implants, you know, and all kinds of things, artificial hips and just to feel complete as a woman. They put on clothes that they cannot afford, you know, just to make an impression. And as I was looking at this, I came across a research that was done um, in Vanderbilt University Medical Center. It's in Tennessee. And it was a long-term study that they followed 3,527 women who had done cosmetic breast implant surgery. And what did they find? That women who do breast implants are nearly three times as likely to commit suicide as other women. And I was like, wow. You know, they do all of these things to find completeness. Yet something inside of them still tells them that there is something missing. And because of the high suicide rate that breast implant surgery I mean, I'm just taking breast implant. You know, you get the, the idea. And doctors said that rather than considering a uh, uh, breast implant, that people should consider a solution to low self-esteem or depression, which is the underlying problem that makes people go after this thing. So um, it, it's pathetic. Some other women, you know, they may be rich, they may be beautiful, well-placed in their careers, but they're telling themselves, if I can just have a husband, a man that will love me, a man that will give me his name to bear, then I will be satisfied. I will be complete. I will feel complete. And um, <clears throat> we're all familiar with, or I, I, we should, I, I can assume, you know, there's a story in the Bible about two sisters, Leah and Rachel. Um, Rachel was the woman that Jacob actually loved. You know, he, she was a woman he wanted to marry and, and he served for her 
for seven years just to get the woman of his dreams. But he was deceived. And uh, on the wedding night, the sister was presented to him instead. And so he decided to serve another seven years to get Rachel. So now he had two of them. And Rachel was the one that was loved and Leah was hated. And because the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah was busy bearing children. I'm reading from the book of Genesis chapter 29, verses 31 to 35. You know, this was a smart woman. She wanted to kill two birds with one stone. She said, if I can bear him children, then maybe I can earn his love. And how many of us women have found ourselves in that position in marriage? You know, I've heard women say they want to solidify this marriage. They want to have children. The pain of, of childlessness, you know, thinking that that is the way you can solidify yourself. And the Bible says, Leah conceived and bare a son and called his name Reuben. For she said, surely the Lord had looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Wow, my husband would love me. And then she conceived again and bare a son and said, because the Lord had heard that I was hated, he had given me this son. And so she called his name Simeon. And she still didn't get it. So she went for another child. And, and she said, now, this time will my husband be joined to me because I have borne him three sons. And finally, she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now I will just praise the Lord. And she called him Judah and stopped bearing because she wasn't getting what she wanted. You know, so these women have used so many different things to look for completion. The question becomes, what then is completion? Sister Elsa, next slide. I'm trying to move along really fast. You know, in order for you to find completion as a woman, there are three questions you must answer. The first question is, who am I? Who am I? The story of the prodigal son is a story that I find very interesting. You know, um, there's a way that God speaks to me. And, you know, on and on in this presentation, you will see me. Uh, talk about that. Who am I? So the prodigal son is the one who said, um, let me get my inheritance now. Let me get my inheritance now and go. And the Bible says he left and he went and lived the wayward life, spent his earnings, you know, whatever he was entitled to, he went ahead and used it recklessly. And he had many friends while he was doing that. And at some point, he was down to nothing. Suddenly, he became so low that he was eating, you know, uh, uh, like, like a servant, a bond servant. That was what he became in a foreign land. All his friends were gone. And the prodigal son asked himself. The Bible says he came to himself. That moment of realization. He came to himself. To me, that, that is one of the most powerful verses in that story of phrases. There's a way that phrases just catch my attention. He came to himself and then he went back to his father. So the issue of who am I, who are you? I want to take a pause here because I don't want this to be just talk, talk. You know, I want you to consider if you have a pen and paper, assuming I stand before you and I say, can you please introduce yourself? I want you to write down what are the things that you're going to, to say about yourself. Take a moment to think about that. 
what do you, how would you introduce yourself? Some time ago, I, I, um, I talked on a topic, issues of identity. It's very serious. If you want to be complete, that's where you start from. Who are you? Um, John the Baptist in the book of uh, John chapter one, John chapter one from verses 19 to 23. You know, when you begin to step into significance as a person, as a woman, you're going to have people ask things like, who does she even think she is? Who do you really think you are? You know, John the Baptist had the elders of the Jews, they sent delegates to go and ask him. I'm reading from John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. The Bible says, this was John's testimony. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, he did not fail to confess freely. He said, I am not the Messiah. And then they asked, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? No. Then finally they said, who are you? Give us an answer so that we can take back to those who sent us, what do you say about yourself? And then he said, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. In that discussion, John decided to introduce himself with his assignment, his purpose. You know, sometimes they ask you, who are you? You say, well, I am, I am, uh, and like, like uh, sister, Nikkei was saying at the beginning, she's a nurse practitioner, you know, uh, your profession, or um, I am a mother of three, because that's where you take your identity from. But John hid behind his assignment in that discussion. He said, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord. That's all he was, a voice. You know, in John chapter eight, the Jews, the Jew, Jewish leaders, they pester Jesus. Tell us who you are. Tell us who are you. You know, who are you? Who are you? They want to know who you are. But you yourself, you have to know who you are. I find out that we don't spend enough time with ourselves. We don't spend enough time knowing ourselves. We go through life just going through the motions. We don't even know, you know, who we really are. And you cannot know yourself by yourself. You have to spend time with your maker. You have to spend time with God so that God can reveal to you because before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you. Before you were created, he knew you. He ordained you. He gave you an assignment. He made you for a purpose. He made you for himself. So in order for you to find out who you are, you need to spend time with God. Think of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6, he was already ministering as a prophet. He was already, you know, declaring the word of God. Yet, when he saw the glory of the Lord, he said, wow, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. That for him was a moment of revelation. I could go on and on, but it is important for us to know who we are. And then the second, um, the second question we need to answer, whose are you? Whose am I? Now, this is a very delicate topic. You know why? Because you, you, you have heard things like, I'm the boss of me. You know, don't tell me, don't tell me I, I am my own person. Some people say I'm self-made, but you don't, you, you don't say that. <laughs> you, I, thank you, Sister Diana says, I am Shelly Diana Hunt. Okay, so she's introducing herself in the chat box. And let's feel free to comment as the message is going on. Um, whose are you? Once again, I was drawn to just a phrase or 
a small sentence in the midst of a story, the story of Ruth. If you go to the book of Ruth, you will read about Ruth and Naomi. And in Ruth chapter two, we find this interesting romantic meeting between Ruth and her kinsman redeemer under the two tutelage of her mother-in-law, you know, mother-in-law was teaching her how to be romantic, how to, you know, get in the midst of um, Boaz's life and, and obtain an inheritance and preserve a generation. And she was there humbly following every instruction. And when Boaz observed Ruth from a distance, oh my God, Boaz asked the question. Ruth chapter two, verse five. He said, whose young woman is this? I'm telling you, when I read that thing for, I was transfixed at that point. Whose young woman is this? Who do you belong to? Whose young woman is this? And that is a question that we all need to address because we must take our, our uh, identity from God. We belong to God. You are God's woman. You might be married to Mr. Audley. I'm getting on you, Sister Nikke, but you are God's woman on assignment. So God is using you to love orderly on his behalf and God is using you to shape the destiny of those children that he's bringing to you and God is using you to affect your generation whose woman is this my beloved is mine and I am his praise God the third question and I'm rushing what are you supposed to be doing what am I supposed to be doing and for this, I look at the story of Esther. Esther. Esther was called to the palace and God had a special mission, an assignment for her to deliver a nation, the nation of the Jews, his people. But Esther was so caught up in the beauty contest and just the, the all the hassles of getting to the palace and she was selected as the first lady of a very big kingdom she was the first lady her husband was was over 127 provinces if you look at it you can say she got to the height of her political career she got to the height you know the highest position for a woman at that time in the nation she was beautiful and everything looked like it was complete. And she was just trying to relax now and enjoy her time as a first lady. Lo and behold, Mordecai sent a message and said, do not think, and I'm reading from Esther, Esther chapter four, verse 12, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you know what was going on with the Jews, they were facing extermination, you know? Uh, Haman was trying to wipe all of them out. And Mordecai had reached out to Esther to help. And he said, if you remain silent at this time, reliance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I'm telling you, when Esther heard those words, something in her woke up. And she said, go and gather together all the Jews, fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or nights. And I and my attendants will fast. And then I will go to, king, even, uh, to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So you see what I'm saying? Esther stepped into purpose because she had someone to push that button inside of her, to tell her, you are made for more than this. She thought she was just called to enjoy the kingdom. But God is calling you to something greater. And I pray that God will give each and every one of us that somebody who will push us to achieve the potentials of God in our lives. She recognized this, that everything she had been through, she went through 12 months of beauty treatment. 
Imagine. So do you think that she went through all that just to be a queen in the palace and enjoy palace food? No. All the things you have been through is not for a waste. God has been preparing you to step into your destiny. And as you hear these words today, I pray that God will help you to arise. I want to round up, you know, quickly as I look at putting God right in the center. You put God in the center, your spiritual life, your health, your career. This is where it all comes together. For Esther, everything came together. Her position, her beauty, all the assets that she had, you know, the eloquence, the wisdom, everything that God had been putting her through. She put to bear her relationships. She brought, for me, you know, that is the ultimate moment when all that you do glorifies God through your career, through your your wife, your role as a wife, your role as a mother, I'm telling you, stepping into this becomes the ultimate because now I am serving my children, but I am doing it as unto the Lord. I, I can't tell you the joy I have when I have an opportunity on my job to tell someone about the Lord, to minister. That was the ultimate for Esther. Do not be deceived by women who look like, and, and, and I want you to just pay attention here because as I prepared this message, this was a word that God gave me specifically for someone. And it is the story of the Shunammite woman. She was a woman who from outside, it looked like she had everything, she was complete. The Shunammite woman, and the Bible says that Elisha came to her uh, she, he used to pass by that place and the woman said that this was a prophet and she told her husband and they built him a place so that whenever he came around, he could relax and pray and refresh. And the man of God was so moved and said, what can we do for this woman? And, and the woman said, I don't lack anything. I am among my own people. She was a woman of wealth and substance. She was influential, accepted in her community. And then the man of God was still troubled. What then can be done for her? And Gehazi replied and said, she has no son and her husband is old. I want to say no matter how much you try to make it look good on the outside, God knows your area of need. And he's here today to meet that need in your life. You might do well hiding it from everybody else. You might look like you're complete. But God says we are complete in him. Can we go to the last slide, Sister Elsa? You are complete in him. Colossians chapter 2. He says we are complete in him from verse 6. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. As I round up today, I just want you to know that if you can answer and say, I belong to God, and you know who you are in Christ, then you'll be able to step into your purpose and become everything that he has created you to be with no part lacking in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Minister Edna, for bringing us this wonderful word of God. We are so blessed. I am particularly blessed. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to introduce myself uh, before I introduce the next guest speaker. My name is Nikke Oldley. <laughs> I'm a, a project management professional with over 10 years of experience. I'm a mother of two, a five-year-old, and a one-month-old. So I'm quite busy with that one month old right now. So I love to travel. I love to sing. I love to uh, develop myself professionally, spiritually, and um, 
career wise as well. So um, basically, I am the event director for yeah, event director at AFAV, and I'm gonna be your MC for today's program. So I'm gonna be with you from the beginning to the end of the program. Um, now it's time to welcome the next guest, and that will be um, Dami Aroyeo. Dami is a lawyer. I would just like to read a brief uh, bio about her. Dami is a lawyer and certified Agile Scrum Master with an extensive experience in legal research and experience working in legal service industry. She has a Master of Law degree with a focus of uh, a focus on international criminal law from St. Mary's University, USA, and a Bachelor's of Law from the University of Sheffield, UK. Dami is also an entrepreneur who became a body shop beauty consultant in June of 2020. She joined the beauty business to help empower women to love the skin they are in. So for the next 20 minutes, she's gonna be blessing us with the wisdom that the Lord had given to her. Please let's welcome Dami Aruya. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yes, my name is Dami, like she said, and thank you, Minister Edna. I was ministered to, and um, I really appreciate all the um, information you have given us because it's important for us to um, know how we're complete as women, uh, regardless of what stage we're in in life. Um, and so I'll just begin my presentation with, uh, when we said necessary, and I should define what completeness is, that's how I was going to start as well. I was like, God, please don't let her say everything <laughs> that I want to say. But um, it, it was a great foundation. And I'm just going to say a few other things that I um, would like to add to that. Um, and yeah, hopefully we learn a thing or two by God's grace. Um, and uh, Sister Elsa is going to help me with my slides. And the first thing I would do is to define completeness. Uh, completeness. Uh, again, uh, it's the same thing she said. Uh, to be complete is to have all the necessary and appropriate parts, like she said. Um, but today I'm just going to emphasize more in the second definition, which is um, to, to be complete is to go to the greatest extent or degree, um, to be total, um, to have everything you need. So to go to the extent degree, um, Ex greater the extent to a degree, yes. Um, there's also definition of finish making, to finish making something uh, or to finish doing something, to make something whole or perfect uh, is also a definition of completeness. Um, on my next slide, I'm just going to also um, touch on some societal views of what makes a woman complete. And I did ask a few <laughs> ladies around me to see what they think and what they um, feel like will make them complete. And I heard, Things like independence. If I'm an independent woman, you know, I feel complete. If I if I have everything together, if I have my career situated, you know, I can provide for myself. I don't have to rely on my um, parents. And this is from a lot of single women, actually. I don't have to rely on my parents for money. I feel complete. I feel like I can stand on my two feet. Um, education. Uh, Minister Edna also referred to this. Um, many people. I don't know if I'm one of those people, but we um, degrees. We want to just you know, LLM, LLB, it just makes you feel like, okay, I'm achieving something, especially if you come from a background where maybe education wasn't really a, a, a thing for people, you know, women didn't get to have this education at some point. So you're like, I'm going to be that woman, I'm going to be the first medical doctor in my family, I'm going to be the first lawyer in my family. So education in this aspect makes people feel complete and then beauty um i expanded on beauty a little bit because i feel like in our world today especially when we see people on social media and see influencers youtubers um and all of these beauty gurus there's a pressure to feel um like you need to get to a certain standard so in us in our society today um there are many people who focus on looking good um and have little to no interest in anything else uh, or anything more tangible um they, don't get me wrong, they're not, there's nothing wrong with looking good, actually. There's, it's, it's good to have a nice um, package on the outside, is what I like to call it. But um, there needs to be content on the inside. Um, if, if so, if uh, uh, Amazon came to your door and they just packaged this nice big box with a bowl and just it looks so beautiful, everything is nicely put together and you open it and maybe you see a bunch of dirty diapers or something. 
it would be very disappointing. So as much as a nice package is, is, is great to have, the content is more important. I would rather you put a box with no bows and there's like the car keys of a Tesla inside or something, something, something of value inside of, of that package. So um, I think the this issue just extends beyond a lost world. Um, sometimes it even gets into the church. Um, yes, we we see all of this as well. Sometimes on Sunday you question if some people came to even focus on what is being preached, or you know, I just want to show you the new pair of shoes I've gotten or this new outfit, it starts to feel like a competition sometimes. Um, and so we need to pay attention to that. Um, there are many of us that are concerned with our hair, makeup and all of those things, which is great, like I said, but we spend hours investing in these things, um, in these things that, um, that are not as important as the value of God. Um, we need to see, we need to focus on how God sees us. Um, we need to think about the Lord's perspective about ourselves. We need to focus on the right things. Um, and I don't know why it reminded me of the verse, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness right now. Um, and every other thing shall be added. So it's focus on the thing that is right. Like uh, Minister Edna said as well, um, if you put Jesus at the center, if you put God at, at the center, it's like everything else is like icing on an already made cake. Um, you're not trying to do the last thing first. You're doing, you're creating your foundation to be firm before you're adding all these things. So if you're already complete and then you have all of these things going on, you're doing your hair, your makeup, there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to know why you're complete because if that gets taken away, then you start feeling inadequate again and it's a cycle. You start again and again and again to feel inadequate. Um, so um, may God help us in Jesus' name regarding that aspect, excuse me, aspects, but um, we, we need to focus on the tangible thing and the tangible thing is to seek Christ um, and every other thing is as um, we would do it unto him, yes. So um, some other things are career, uh, our children, uh, marriages and uh, husband, people feel like this is something that would make them feel complete. So under marriage, real quick, I'm just going to talk about the divorce gap and I'll explain why I'm um, talking about that um, briefly. So I, I decided to add that because if, for example, the person feels marriage makes them complete and something happens, anything happens, many things happen these days, and that marriage has to end and divorce too can be replaced with uh, God forbid, but the death of a spouse. What happens then if you have um, focused all your energy and this is the one thing that makes me complete? What happens then? It's like you're relying on a human being to be complete, and that human being is more um, is not immortal. Anything can happen at any time. So what happens to you then? Uh, and I just have a few statistics. According to Stephen Jenkins, is a professor at the London School of Economics. He did a research. And he said there's a decline in uh, women's income when their marriages end. And like I said, we can also add the, uh, a death of a spouse. Uh, when the marriages end, when a spouse dies, there's a decline in their income. Why? Sometimes it's because women have stopped working. They focus everything on let's raise the children while the man is busy chasing his own purpose, his own dreams. Um, but uh, there's a common perspe uh, perspective that uh, women make out better than men in a divorce proceeding. Uh, that women who have uh, women who walked before, during, or after marriages, there's a 20% decline. Like I said, uh, and this professor has researched, and he's saying that the reason is, or the reason could be, like I said, they stop working, they focus on their children, they focus on their families, and then when it's time to get back into the workforce, is like. Uh, I haven't worked for 10 years, but I want you to trust me to, you know, maybe a doctor, for example, I want you to trust me to, 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 to treat this patient and perform surgery and this person is like, um, sis, you're going to have to maybe go back to school or do something. So there's this, um, it's like we're on the losing end if we don't, if we don't work on our own purpose during that time. And also another thing I wanted to touch on in regards to this, because it feels sometimes when I was preparing, I was like, is it insensitive to say um, a woman who is taking care of her children and focusing on her children um, is not doing something or, you know, cause it's not fair to say that they're, they're actually working hard, right? But when a, in a century or in a, a generation where there's so many things that can be done 
um, on yourself from home. And I can use myself as an example. I feel like um, I'm, I'm not married by the way, but I feel like um, uh, while or thinking about marriage and thinking about being in a, uh, in a marriage setting, I'm thinking my calling or my purpose is one of my purposes that I think is to help young adults, um, youths to sort of mentor them and things like that. So if I were to get married today and God just decides, okay, triplets one time, in Jesus' name, no. Um, I get, I, I, I have triplets um, at once, and obviously, I cannot just be going to court or still be doing the things as usual, or, or encouraging youth by going to all the conferences at that time. But it doesn't mean it has to stop. Here we are over the internet having this conversation. I can still be working on purpose as I'm still um, doing other things. I can have a blog. I can there's so many ways, there's so many things we just need to, and it takes sometimes talking to each other, um, other women to get this inspiration. So I feel like we, I feel like we need, somebody said, well, bless God for the triplets. <laughs> it's as well. <laughs> um, I, I feel like we need to um, work on ourselves regardless of the platform. So the platform might shift. You may not be able to do it um, on the, the way you used to do, but now it's just you thinking up an idea of how to live that balanced life wherever you are. So um, this divorce gap, like I said, I put it there just so we can see this effect because the man comes out of it um, and then he has been doing his own, um, developing himself and working on himself. And so he can just continue life as usual and earn as much money as usual. And here you are with children. He's not, maybe child support is not going to help the, um, the full picture and all of those things and even death as well. Nobody plans for their spouse to die, but it happens. And then we're just left in the limbo with the children and having to feed them. If they came with food from heaven or something now, maybe maybe we can you know say God is taking care. Of, I mean, he's taking care of them. He will take care of them, but you need to think about these things. Anything can happen at any time. Create generational wealth for your children. Don't just leave it to one human being that cannot, something can also happen to it. I, it feels like, what if something happens? What then, you know? So let us, let us help ourselves. Let us find out what God wants us to do. So um, I'll just go to the next slide real quick. And I just ask the question then. So after all this, if it is not marriage, if it is not your career, if it is not your independence or beauty, what really makes a woman complete then? And on my next slide, I say the answer is purpose, purpose, purpose. You have to know what God wants you to do on earth. Um, a lack of purpose is always missing, is always the missing piece of this puzzle. Um, there's a lot of things going on. It, it, it's part of, it's like a box of pizza. There's, there's one slice, one of the slices is marriage, the other slice is children, the other slice is this. But something would always be missing if you don't know your purpose. You just keep chasing and chasing. And it's really important for you to understand your purpose as God's daughters um, and what is intent for our gender within his design. What is it? We need to know that. We must understand our essence. We must understand his plans for us and the value he has given us as women because he has given us value. He didn't just put us here to occupy space or just be popping babies or that's not, that's not why anybody was just created just for that. So there's a reason why you're here. Um, and on my next slide, <laughs> thank you, Sister Elza. Um, I sort of wanted to discuss roles versus purpose because I feel like this is where the disconnect may be. Um, and for roles, uh, roles are pretty much from culture, uh, to be honest. Um, culture varies in different places. So in Nigeria, the roles of a woman or the role of a woman might differ a little bit from the role of a woman in America. And so what happens then if you're going through different countries? Are you just going to keep changing? That's just the random question on the side, but, but role is from culture um, and purpose originates from God. Um, we, have, we, we have women who are planning, who are playing roles, but they, but they do not know their purpose. Uh, in Dr. Miles Monroe's book uh, titled The Power of Purpose, he says, everything in life was created for purpose. If you're here on earth, then there's a reason you're here. Uh, the problem and, uh, and essentially what causes a woman to feel incomplete or inadequate is her life is not purpose driven and purpose is the only thing 
only thing that can bring fulfillment. Uh, and this is where also I, I also wrote down what Minister Enna, um, the three questions she posed. And she says, uh, who am I? Who's am I? And what am I supposed to be doing? That what am I supposed to be doing is very, 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 very key. I can't emphasize it enough for us to um, feel complete. Um, so our culture tells us what brings fulfillment. And those are the things I've just talked about. Beauty, independence, you're a great mother. In fact, no matter how, uh, no matter how complete you feel, if you're somewhere and your baby is crying and, and you, you are just there, you are just, one woman will give you one eye like, what's this one doing? Why are you not responding? Why are you not like, what kind of woman is this? Make you feel as if all everything you've achieved in life is just worthless. Um, and so it, you start feeling inadequate again. So, um, but the only thing that brings fulfillment, like I said, is um, purpose. But in our world today, if your purpose does not pay well, <clears throat> you will leave your purpose and you chase money, uh, and then you don't understand why you're not happy. Uh, this is you allowing the world to define who you are. That's also the part uh, I appreciated that Mr. Minister Edna said about who, whose you are, right? Am I? Yes, whose am I, and uh, who, uh, who am I? So it's, if you don't know it, they will tell you. If you don't know, if you don't know who you are, if somebody comes to you now and says, ah, you are such a boy, you will sit down there and be like, no, I know I'm a woman because you know, that's why nobody can convince you otherwise. But if you don't know, they will come and tell you and you, too, you start looking at yourself like, ah, maybe it's true. Maybe I can't do this. Maybe I can't do that. Maybe I, maybe I, I shouldn't be doing this. So you, you, you allow them to find you if you don't know who you are, which is very important. So I guess, again, the question then is how then do I find purpose? which is um, my next slide. How then do I find purpose? Uh, please, can I, okay, thank you. <laughs> How then do I find purpose? It's knowing the manufacturer's intent. If we had a car, uh, I like using Tesla, I don't know why. Maybe I'm speaking it into existence for myself. Um, if a Tesla was created and there's a manual, right? Uh, the the CEO, the person who created it, knows why he created it. But you, you are just there like, oh, I've seen a test. I'm just going to fling. I'm just going to figure figure it out. You're not. You don't. You don't know anything about anything. You haven't watched any videos. You don't know anything. You just want to go and figure out how to use the test. you might run into some issues. You don't know what the intent was. You don't know if it's because Tesla is very different from other cars. Like I've heard, it has updates coming in overnight, so many fun stuff like that. But if you don't know and you're treating your Tesla like a what Volvo or something, you probably not get the max, you'll not be able to maximize um, what the purpose of it is. Our manufacturer here, let's say we're a product, we're not products, but let's say we are a product, is God. And our manual is the Bible. Many Africans, like myself, we hardly read manuals. We just get something and start building the table and then one leg is up, the other leg is down. We're not, <laughs> we're not, we're not able to build it right. We just say, I will do it by myself. And then after you do everything, it doesn't work. Where do you go back to? You start reading the manual to figure out how to build it. But you came to this world, excuse me, you came to this world. The Bible is already here. You have access to talking to God, but you still want to do it by yourself. And then after you've done everything, you come back to God again and say, okay, God, I've tried everything. And then uh, you've wasted years that you could have figured out what purpose is. So God is the manufacturer. He made us, he's our maker. And he, um, he knows, he has intent. He knows why he created us. And our manual here is the Bible. Um, I have an extract. I'm just going to uh, read what I wrote to you. It says, if you do not know the original intent of your manufacturer, you will abuse the product. Every device, uh, car, DVD player, microwave, they all come with manuals. The manual is the thoughts of the manufacturer. It's what the manufacturer thinks this product should be used for. When he was creating it, he intentionally put things in place for this product. Um, the manufacturer then gives you a book maybe with your phone, for example, and it says here, read my mind. You know, we can't all just be knocking on the manufacturers. I'm talking about earthly now manufacturers. We can't just all go to their houses to be finding out. So he um, articulates it well and puts a nice cute book inside the box as well. And he says here, read my mind. Um, you don't ask the phone 
how to operate the phone, you go to the manual, you read the thoughts of the maker. Um, and here God is our maker, like I said, he's the manufacturer. Um, the manual has his intent, has the intent of the maker. Um, in Jeremiah, I believe Jeremiah 1, 5, yes, I opened it. He said, before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. He knew you. He gave you everything, everything you need. Everything, a for example, yes, a woman, a baby, a two-month-old baby, she has everything she needs to reproduce inside of her as she's two like that, two months old. She has everything already inside of her, her to do these things. And so God has given us everything we need, but how do we use it? Because when a Tesla comes, everything needed for you to use that Tesla is there. But if you don't know, many people have driven their cars um, so many times, they don't know that this is for this or that is for that. You just know that this car is taking me from point A to point B. But then you've spent all this money on this type of car and you can't even use all the functions. That would be very interesting because I know many of us fall into that ball. So God has given you all that you need, but are you using, um, your, are you maximizing your potential? Um, and how do you find out what the potential is? Because obviously you, you may not see everything if you don't know it's even there in the first place. And going back to the manufacturer to ask these questions, to, to, to know what is intent for you was, is the best way. And also reading your manual. Um, we're supposed to read God's mind concerning us and to find out our purpose. And we will never be abused because we know who we are. So nobody needs to tell us what we are. So it's important to use your resources, your manufacturer, your maker, God. And the manual is the Bible use your resources. To be complete is to find purpose. Um, and there are more practical steps to find, there are other practical uh, steps, I guess, to find purpose as well. Um, one of the ways is to, um, to realize, if you, if you realize that there's a need somewhere, for example, I'm still on my other side, yes. Um, if you realize that there's a need somewhere, um, that's one way to know what God may be calling you to do. If you're in church every Sunday and you can tell that soprano is not singing with their parts, um, auto is not saying their part this person you are trying to fix it but you're just sitting on your seat maybe you are supposed to be a helper there maybe that's where or one of the places because purpose i feel like purpose can you can have purpose um in different um aspects of the world i i stand to be current corrected but um if you're sitting somewhere you're always seeing a problem if you're seeing delivery truck drivers and you're like, oh, there may be a better way to do this. They can just order it online. I'm just making an uh, example of who did, the people who started doing online delivery. I'm sure they, they saw a problem and then they went to go and figure out how. And then now they do it. And we're all shouting, richest person in the world. Da, 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 da. It came to somebody's mind. And if you think about it very well, for me, Shia, when God says something to me and I don't do it or I... Or, I, or an idea and I just talk myself out of it. Like two weeks later, I will see somebody doing something similar online. And I'm like, it's like I was coming, I was figuring it out and you just gave somebody else the idea. So if you don't take, or if you don't take it on and start doing something about it, improving your skills and starting, some people think they need to be completely made in that thing before they start. No, just start, growth will happen. And so God gives us all these ideas as women, as men, anybody, God gives us all these ideas, but we brush it up or off or we say it's not time or we say it's not, it's not the season. God, I have, we are giving excuses for God, but God does not, if you multiply it is zero, it will still be zero. You need to, you need to give yourself, I'm available and you help you balance it as well. And that's where this maker manufacturer thing also comes into play. It's like, I'm, I'm here, I'm going to do it, but I need help because I have this responsibility. I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a PhD student, I'm a full-time worker, I, I, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, but I need a balance that, and it will help you. If you're trying to do it on your own, that's when it seems impossible. You can't just do everything by yourself because you didn't even create yourself. So why are you stressing? Go back to the God that created you and it will help you um, with inspiration on how to be balanced as well, um, live a balanced life. And God sends help as well. Um, it's just discernment to recognize. Um, I was telling some of my sisters yesterday that when the devil wants to do something, he sends people. When God wants to do something, he also sends people. <laughs> discernment is knowing who sends who. So we need to um, also have that, um, we need to be aligned with the Holy Spirit to know who sends who, but he sends help. That I know. He sends help. Um, he sends. He gives inspiration. He gives you the ability to do 
what you need to do if you would just rely on him. So um, yes, and also the another point here, I said become an intern of the world. What I mean by that, um, you know, um, I, I was thinking about, uh, for example, doctors when you do clothes housemanship or what I, I don't remember what you call it. If they're doing like a housemanship um, and they're trying to you know, finish up medical school. So they go through all these departments in the hospital. They, they do like pediatrics and then they do, um, what else? They do emergency. So they're here for like two weeks. They do the 12 hour shift. If you're still figuring out a good way to just be available and serve. So during Christmas, you you, you start with, maybe you do this ministry of, of helping and feeding the homeless. The next year you're like, okay, let me just join this choir. It's so quick to know if you are, if singing is your calling or not, just a few times. So you can, you can do it. And then if it doesn't work out, you do something else. So it's okay to just get those experiences, even inside of something that is not your purpose. If you're doing something, you can find out, okay, this is this, I felt this way when I did this, I, 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 think I may have something to contribute to this place. So you keep doing it and then it will get clearer and clearer. But if you are sitting down doing nothing, like I said, if, if you multiply zeros, it will still be zeros. So just get something, do something, commune with God, talk to God, seek him and clarity will come. It may not come in one day, it may not come in six months, it may not come in one year, but just know that it will come because God said before you were even formed, he knew you. So he knew where you, what, what you were going to do. So just stick with him and you will know, don't go and do it off on your own. It's like an iPhone saying that, you know, I'm, I'm just going to start doing things on my own. Nobody should send me updates. I'm just going to become my own boss. Like your phone, what do you want to do by yourself? Or you're like, no owner, nothing. You have to still be under authority of your maker to to be to find your purpose you can't find purpose outside of god is i'm sorry to say but it's impossible i don't know i'm sorry but it's impossible to find purpose um outside of god um so i just put a few points to note um that uh that we can take away and hopefully um enlarge and learn more things about to move forward and feel complete in christ because like i said that's where you can find completeness Points to note, if we, that's my, the last slide, yes. If we want to be whole, we need to yield our will to God's will. Um, sometimes we're already complete, that's the second point. Sometimes we're already complete, um, but we're leading, uh, and we're leading a purpose-driven life, but outside sources make us feel incomplete all over again. So you're already where God wants you to be. You're already doing what God wants you to do. You're improving yourself. And then people start telling you, more things. I'll give you an example of uh, a story of myself just before I round off. Um, so I, um, December was my birthday, right? And I just turned 27. And so I just turned 27. And so I was happy. I, I still am happy. I was happy. I had all these expectations from God. This year was different for me. I was just thankful. And like, I had, I heard words from God for my life. So I was like, yes, this year is going to be great. 27 is great. I was telling all my friends, I know. So I was on that kind of high. And then I went to church one day. It was inside the church. This lady was like, happy birthday, Dami. I was like, thank you so much. I was like, so how old did you turn again? I was like, I turned 27. And she was like, ah, you better do fast though. At your age, I already had two children. I said, yes, yes, ma, God bless you. <laughs> it is well, amen. <laughs> And I just walked away. And I, honestly, I didn't think about it much then, but did it do something to me? Yes, I went to go and think again that God, eh, she, you will not help me like this. I know God's time is, if he will settle all of us in our different areas of life. I know, I, like I said, I had all of those thoughts and I knew that God had my, like whatever the situation is, it, something will still happen. So I knew that things, she doesn't even know whether something is already happening, she doesn't know, but she was just saying all those things. And I felt it, it hit something. Um, but I just wanted to share that you may be where God wants you to be because his time for you, his timetable for you is different from Mrs. A's timetable for you, Mr. A's timetable for you. He walks all things together for our good. So don't let anybody, it's hard, we have emotions, we have feelings, but don't let anybody come and tell you who you are. If God has not said it, then who are, who are they to say it? Even you, then you, who are you to say it? If God has said, hey, who are you to come and say, this is not happening? No, his word is here and amen, it's final. So we need to 
hone into what God has said concerning our lives and not what other people are saying to define us. And the last point I would like us for, uh, to take away is that God needs to occupy his space in our hearts if we would keep looking, uh, if not, we will keep looking for satisfaction um, from external sources, um, societal standards. Uh, we can't be looking to operate uh, a Tesla, for example. I know I've used a Tesla a lot. We can't be looking to operate a Tesla in a Toyota RAV4 manual. You can't be reading a Toyota RAV4 manual to, to operate a Tesla. No, nothing will work. You might see a few things like drive, park, all of those things. But when it gets to the maximizing the use of a Tesla, you can't find it. It is not possible. It's just not because it's not, there are different minds, different manufacturers. So whose manual are you reading concerning the life, um, your own life? Are you reading your maker's manual or are you reading somebody else's manual for your life? Um, so God is our maker, like I said, our manufacturer. We need to seek his face. We need to know his intent for our lives so we can live a full and wholesome life. And whether you are married, single, um, I don't know, master's, bachelor's degree, it is possible to be complete. In fact, you should be complete before you take on other things because many people for marriage for example you feel like marriage is going to make you whole that means there's a vacuum currently and then you get there and you realize that no it's not happening because this person is not doing what you think he would do because i heard that is is different from what some people think it is and then you get there and there's no you're not getting the the wholeness or satisfaction um that you're expecting and then you, have, you start looking for other things again and you, it's just chaos so you need to be whole. Your, your husband, if you're not married yet, your future husband deserves, and so, does, so do you, deserves a whole person. Then marriage would be the icing on the cake of already whole person. And so um, that's all I have to share today. Thank you for listening and thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sister Dami. I'm really loving this, actually. <laughs> I am loving this. Um, Thank you so much for the word. Um, I love the fact when you mentioned that we need to present ourselves as a nice package on the outside and also have good content on the inside. But the only thing we can say is that the Lord Almighty will lead us in the right way. Yeah, to live a purposeful life. Thank you so much for the word and thank you for your time. Uh, I'm gonna yield my time to Sister Elsa. There's a short game to be played. I thank you, Nikki. Wow, amazing. I didn't know, I, I, I've known Dami. I'll tell you a funny story about Dami. I met Dami in church a couple of years back. And for some reason, I just felt God say, it was a Christmas day that she invited her to lunch at the house. So she came to my house and we had lunch and I was going to drop her back. Dami, if you're there, <laughs> I'm sure you remember what's going to say. I'm going to say, so I decided to drive my husband's car to go drop her off uh, uh, at home. Uh, <laughs> As we were driving, I did not realize what I thought was the break was the hood to release the hood. And as we were getting on the highway, I pulled the lever and they put just the, um, the what they call bonnet or the hood of the uh, front of the car just opened. Danny, you remember that story? God. Yeah. When I told my husband, I was like, man, the girl would think he wanted to murder her. Thank you very much. That was a fun uh, topic. So right now we're going to um, have uh, the playing a game. Uh, if you can, if can you all go to afavmp.org? Nikkei, please, can you post the link in the comment section? <clears throat> and if you go to the events page, uh, there's something that says start a game. I am going to show you the sign-in information, the login information for the yeah. game. Can you all see my screen? I'm not sure if you're seeing my screen. Can you see my screen, Nike? Okay, I can see you say yes. So <laughs> I need to start this screen. So I've pasted, yeah. It's all right, <laughs> thank you. So let me share the, the next, my um, browser. Thank you. So, people just have to bear with us. Sometimes, you know, technology can. Um, <clears throat> Sister Elsa. Hey, how you doing, Carol? <laughs> it's been years. Oh my God. My friend just sent me this link. I have no idea what's happening. I'm sorry, everybody. But I just have to <laughs> say hi because you are definitely somebody that I miss. How is Aww. it going? God bless you. Thank you for. God bless you. Thank, thank you. you so much for, you know, 
encouraging me or talking to me like this. I apologize, everybody. Okay, just want to say hi. Bye. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that, Kara. I appreciate it. Okay, so please, you're going to pardon me. I'm going to share my screen. And my my co my co game presenter is not here right now, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to make myself a co host and share my other screen. We're going to play a game. Um, <clears throat> present. All right. All righty. Let me share this other screen. Ask your participants to. So can you all click that link um, on that page? If you go to the resource page, can you click the link? If you go to the resource page, if you're there, please let me know. If you're on the page, let me know. All right. <clears throat> All right, I need to log back into my account. My session timed out, okay. So we're going to be playing a game. I'm gonna change my screen to the presentation screen in a few minutes. And um, if you can go to, um, let me, like, I don't want you to see the, if you go to slido.com, go to slido.com or you can click the resource. When you get there, you wanna enter um, 93811. Can you see that? If you have it, please just um, comment. Nikia, can you please check the comments? Are you all seeing the comments? Is anybody, have you been uh, gone to slido.com and entered the meeting ID 93811? Because I'm going to start this squeeze. <clears throat> are you all there? There is a prize to be won or there are prizes to be won. All right. So... All right, so, um, oh my goodness, I just X'd out. We're going to start again. What's the code again, please? Slido.com. I'm trying to wait for, I can see Busola and some other people have, have gone in. <laughs> Present in. What's the code? Night three. Can you see this? Did you all see the code on the <clears throat> 93811? Can you see it? Some people have answered. What is the leading cause of death? These are the options. If you are there, can you choose one? What is the leading cause of death in females, regardless of what country you're in? <clears throat> if you have asked, have you all answered? Oh, it says the quiz results are closed. I apologize. Yes, it was 20 seconds. So the answer is heart disease. <clears throat> so heart disease is the leading cause of death in women. I'm going to, we're going to send out all this information. And the reason why we are putting all this in questions uh, is for us to get thinking. And funny enough, some of the things that Dami talked about in this slide, and we did not co uh, collaborate in any way. As women, we have to take care of our health. <clears throat> heart disease comprises of things like they will tell you um hypertension high cholesterol and things so we have to know all these things because believe me if you if you if i still feel like i was just born yesterday but you know as i'm decades old i'm over 40 years old most of you will know that because i celebrated my 40th birthday so there's no need to hide again as we grow older we need to be mindful of these things so, um, like I said, the leading cause of death is a, um, in women is heart disease. Please do your research. The next question. <clears throat> Hold on. It says, what percentage of cervical cancer can be prevented by pap, smears, uh, pap test, smear test and vaccination? You have 12 more seconds to answer, 11, 10. <clears throat> Uh, most people said 93%. Um, some people said 73%. <clears throat> and 53% for um, some said 53%. Um, the answer is 
it's it's um it's cervical cancer kills very fast. Now um there is a there's a vaccine. Please, Sister Edna, you can jump in here or any of the medical people. It's called <clears throat> I can't remember off the top of my head for to prevent cervical cervical cancer. Um, they give it to teens. Now, the reason why a lot of people are skeptical about this vaccine, which please do your own research. It came out around um, 2006, I think 2006 or seven is because they haven't actually um, seen the, like a cycle of the effect of this vaccine on um, <clears throat> young people. But it's very important that we should do our research to see if the vaccine to prevent cervical cancer, which is called by caused mainly by HPV um, virus, can be prevented by taking this vaccine and pap smear. If you live in the Western world, um, take it, having a pap smear regularly is something that is is um, we do. But unfortunately, a lot of times in um, developing countries, having a pap smear test is not something that we take serious. So please. For whatever reason, I know you may not want to go to the doctor. I have, I, I always request female um, gynees and, or you can, even if you prefer a black um, gynecologist, you can um, re, um, request for them or whoever you feel comfortable with, but whatever it is, please take your um, health um, very seriously. Um, bre um, breast examination, pap smear testing and different tests as we go along. Um, <clears throat> in age, thank you. So the next question. Says, select all the factors that affect, that are, that are pregnancy related deaths. Select all the factors that are pregnancy related deaths. All the factors you think are pregnancy related deaths, select mm -hmm. them. All right, our time is up. Okay, um, the number one is um, in the week after delivery, severe bleeding, high blood pressure and infection are most common. Correct, however, all these factors are pregnancy related deaths. It is that it, um, statistically, you know that African-American women in the United States have the highest postpartum deaths, mm -hmm. that is pregnancy related deaths. So please, <clears throat> um, um, the, uh, 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 with all the things that are um, put on women, please, we have Dr. Fumi on the line. We have um, uh, Minister Edna. She's a nurse practitioner. Please jump in at any time. <clears throat> we have to be very careful. I've, I've lost two friends. Both of them, one was she died a few days, be, a few months before her 40th birthday after having a child. I had another friend that passed away last year after having a child. And the, the, the sad part is that they died not immediately have, after giving birth. They died days later. One had already gone back home and she died from internal bleeding. I've had the other friend, I can't exactly say what it was that caused her death. So we have to be very careful. Please be your sister's keeper. If you don't, if you feel something is not right, you have to make noise. That is why I would recommend if you're going to get a, an obstetrician or a gynecologist, please get someone you're very comfortable with so you can um, complain if anything doesn't seem right. I have Abbas Adia Adam seeing on the line also. If any of you at any time, maybe during our Q&A, you can jump in and comment on this. So please, cardiomyopathy, weakened heart muscle is the leading cause of death one week to one year after delivery. So please, let's take care of ourselves. Just note all these answers on the screen because they are very important. Let me not take too much time. <clears throat> so everything, all the answers on the board are correct. If you selected everything, kudos to you. I don't see the leaderboard at the end. We'll see who the, oh, let me see. I think this is, um, Noye is leading. Ah, okay. Alice Boachi is second. Vic is next. Miss Tammy Anderson is next. And Fumi, Fumi, I hope this is not Dr. Fumi because <laughs> I think we'll disqualify you from competing. So uh, let's go to the next question. What percentage of women leave financial planning to their spouses? What percentage of women leave financial planning to their spouses? We have eight more seconds. Seven, six, five, four, Ooh. three, no, 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 two, no, no, no. and one. And the answer is, Oh, most people said 81 to 98%. It's just, we don't even trust ourselves. 
<laughs> most of us say most women, we are, so we are all saying most women leave financial planning to our spouses. The correct answer is 51 to 81 to 58 oh. percent. You see, um, financial planning, even if you're not working because you are, uh, we, we're talking about, we talk about ages, stages, and phases in life. I commend when women have to be stay-at-home moms, but I would recommend, strongly recommend that stay-at-home, being a stay-at-home mom is for a season, and it's, uh, it's a phase of life. I would even recommend that while you are a stay-at-home mom, you should find something doing. I read an article while preparing for this. It was a woman who, she was a stay-at-home mom. She was white, by the way. She was a stay-at-home mom and her husband passed away. And she said she couldn't even mourn her husband because all of a sudden she had debt collectors calling her. She had little children she didn't know how to take care of. You have to have financial planning. Danny hinted on it. Please be 100% involved. If you know for the for now, you are a stay-at-home mom. I know that in Western world, we have things like life insurance. See, life insurance does not replace a person's life. However, life insurance gives you that less one, God forbid it won't be any of our portion, but one less thing the woman has to worry about in the eventuality that she loses her spouse whatever way. You understand, it is one less thing that you have to worry about. And another thing that I will say is, God forbid, I have seen um, people that good intentions, good marriages and everything, but they end up in divorce. You want to be well informed of everything that is going on in your finances. You cannot leave your finance, financial planning 100% to your spouse. Both of you have to do it together. It doesn't mean that you're both earning the same thing. You could be earning more or he could be earning more. And maybe in this stage of season in your life, you're a stay-at-home mom. You have to be aware of what is going on. Not Maybe not having a spouse that keeps going to work and not knowing that you guys are on the verge of bankruptcy. So please be involved in your um, finances. And for those that are still dating, it is very important that you, especially if you're in the Western world, at some point, if you know you're going to get married to someone, you need to know their financial health. You need to know if it's a credit check, whatever it is, you need to, you both of you need to bring everything on the table and know what you're working with. Let me go to the next question. And the leaderboard, let me see who is leading. No, you is still leading. Okay. All right. Next question um, says, what percentage of poor people in America are elderly females? What percentage? And um, Dami, isn't it amazing that you talked about a similar thing and we did not collaborate? And this is one of the questions. What percentage of poor people in America are elderly females? People, most people say 40%, 80%, 20%. The answer is um, 60%. <laughs> 60%. Now, if you're looking at demographics, you're talking about young female, um, young male, or elderly female, older female, older male. 60% of elderly females in America are, are poor. I will tell you something that I heard from Dave Ramsey. He's a good financial person. He said, a lot of times when people are planning retirement, especially if it's the husband working alone, God forbid that the man has medical conditions, he said. He said, by the time he, maybe he, they are older, and if he has medical issues, most of the time, the money that was saved for retirement is spent on the man's health. That when he dies, the wife becomes penniless. So as much as your husband has a financial plan, both of you need to have something in place for both of you. For example, if you're going to retire with a million dollars, there should be some level of how both of you are going to spend this million dollars when you retire or whatever source of income that you're going to have. Because if 60% um, of the poor people in America, and, and the, the worst thing that in Africa and other parts of the world, it is worse, the percentage of elderly poor females is even higher. Let me tell you something. Sorry, I'm, I'm taking time. Uh, Nikkei, please pardon me. I will tell you what I've experienced of late. I wish I could call my mother-in-law to bear me witness. There, I, have, I know of a lot of, see, 
it's our desire to grow up and um, be grandparents. But that should not be your only desire because I've, she tells me stories. We, um, she tells me stories. I've, I've seen it happen. I've seen where elderly women will have to go and live with their children or their in-laws because there's no source of income for them. Do you know how frustrating that can be for an elderly person? We need to plan. It is, it's, it's frustrating when you as an independent woman, all of a sudden you become 100% reliable or dependent on your child. And next thing, it, it causes unnecessary squabbles between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, uh, mother and child, because it's, it's, it's not, we need to plan better for ourselves. Your retirement plan should not be, I will go and move in with one of my child and I'll be going from one place to another. It can be very frustrating. And a lot of us, our mothers made those sacrifices. We should, right now, it's not too late to start planning. Of course, you will spend time with your grandchildren, but that should not be your retirement plan or you would live your life. You could live your elderly life in frustration. You know, being a, living with your, your children, it's, um, it's a blessing. But like I said, that should not be your plan. Thank you. And the next question says, what percentage of sexual abuse against children are committed by people the children know? Sorry for the typo. What percentage of sexual abuse against children are committed by people the children know? All right, let me see. Most people answered, 43% answered 90, 43% answered 70. And the correct answer is 90%, 90%. Please women, I see why, so it's like talking out of both sides of our mouth. You see the importance of why sometimes we have to stay at home and be stay at home moms. At the same time, we also have to be very careful and very watchful because most times children are abused by people they know, aunties, uncles, neighbors, excuse me, people you know, not a stranger, not someone off the street. So please, let's be very watchful. And we have one more question to go. It says, what percentage of businesses in the U.S. are owned by women? Sorry, my statist um, statistics are from the U.S. because of uh, my location. What um, percentage of businesses in the U.S. are owned by women? We have four more, three more, two more. Uh, most people said 55%. And the answer is 40%. I will tell you something, one thing that I've realized, most of the entrepreneurs that are coming up are women. So kudos to women. I can even say probably in Africa, this number may be a little higher, being that from the Akarasela to the Moi Moi Meka to the yeah. woman that owns a fashion store, they are all business women. So whatever your hands find you to do, do it with all your might. You have to take it seriously. You could, sometimes you don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. You just um, can modify things, you know? So, um, like I said, um, women, we can be very resourceful. 40% is an encouraging number, being that just years ago, most people just relied solely 100% on their um, spouses. So let's see, that's the um, last of our questions. And the winner is Fumi. Please, what Fumi is this? Is this Dr. Fumi or Yesile? Fumi, is that you? Fumi. Yes. Father. Oh no, you are disqualified. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Should they disqualify her? It's okay. Can Should they disqualify her? No. 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 Okay. Okay. No. So Fumi is the winner. Thank you. Followed by Mrs. Anderson and Pris Priscilla. Please, can you all send your email addresses to uh, to? Um, Nikia Odili, check for her in the chat, send your information to her. You get your gift, either a book or something from Body Shop, from um, Dami's Body Shop, by the way, or something nice. I won't, I won't send you this. This is from Elizabeth. I will send it to someone else. I don't know if, if, if any one of you is interested in this. It's Herbal Life. Let me know, any of the winners. It's from Elizabeth, as courtesy of her. Uh, so just let me know. All right, thank you. And that's it for our game. I uh, uh, apologize that we took time on this, you know, technology things. Um, Nikia, please, what's next on the 
Uh, I think the next one is picking um, a winner from the reg um, from the attendees. Okay, the so we are giving away more gifts. So, um, Fumi, can you pick a number from one to what, Nike? Uh, on the on this pressure, we have, I think we have eighty one registered um, participants, but I can see okay. eighty two participants on here. So, I don't know. But so I think sorry, you have to have registered. For you to get a uh, give Nikkei, I hand it back to you. So for me, pick a number and uh, Nikkei, if it's any one of us, don't put pick, she has to pick <laughs> another number so we can send the person a gift. All right. Okay, so who is picking the number? For me, that okay. was the last game. Thank you. 41. 41. So on the spreadsheet here, we have Omo Wumi Makinde. She's the lucky winner. Omo, um, me back in there. Are you on the line? Okay, you have an email address, right? Okay, okay, yeah, I can see she's yes. online. So we'll be sending you a gift. Um, uh, Nikkei, you have an email address. Okay, thank you. What's next? Nikkei, I'm handing it back to you. Okay, okay, so the next item on the agenda is um, our third guest speaker. In the person of Pastor Kenny Akins. So I'm just going to read a little bit about her bio before she begins to uh, bless us with the word of God. Um, Dr. Kenny, Kenny Akins is also known as the three, D3D woman in an international motivational speaker and woman coach who focuses on helping women in their businesses, career, and their spirituality. She is the president of Saving Women of Today, SWAT, an outreach empowering women reaching over 500 members with her Girls Table Talk outreach program. She mentors young girls into self-discovery. She is also the proprietress of Success Link Bridge School and College, Lekki, Lagos, Nigeria. She is a married mother of three grown children. Please, let's welcome Pastor Dr. Kenny Akins. Thank you, everyone. Good evening from Nigeria, and um, good morning or good afternoon um, in other parts of the world. I'm super excited to be here, and thank you so much, Elva, for this uh, opportunity and privilege. Thank you so much, um, Nike. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you I also appreciate the first two speakers. Um, Minister Edna and um, Dami. That was an awesome time. And like yeah. Dami said, when she started speaking, I'm just like, I hope she doesn't say everything. <laughs> so but hopefully, I'm just going to take it from where Dami stopped. And um, I'm going to really be looking at the identity crisis. Identity Come out. Because, uh, by the grace of God, I've been married for about 25 years, over 25 years. And um, in all my life, I've seen women either um, emerge or they are submerged as a result of whatever happens or what life has thrown at them. So what makes a woman complete? What makes a woman complete? Um, like um, Dami said, the education, your qualification, the beauty, the makeover, you know, money, business, uh, your children, and all of that, you know, and like Dami said, I think someone was saying at 27, I've already, I'm married or this or that. I have a friend that we went to school together. And I mean, at my age, she's not yet married, but she's fulfilled. And this is a point I want women to quite understand tonight that regardless of your, your status, whether you're a single girl, a single lady, you're married. Most women are married and they are single because they are not getting the attention that they desire from their spouse. I mean, Minister Edna told us about Leah, that she kept on saying, oh, now my husband will do this now because I've given him this, or now that I've gone to, you know, um, I've, gone to, I've gone to have a makeover, or now that I'm doing this, maybe I'll, I'll get a validation or something from him. So regardless of your status, whether you're a single lady, you're a young girl, you're married, you're a widow, you're a single mother, and all of that, you need to um, define your identity. And until you define your identity, 
you will never be able to walk in the fullness of your capacity. So I'm just going to go straight into it because I, I love to keep to time. I, just, I know I just have like 20, 25 minutes. The first thing I want to talk about is the identity factor. So I'd like to go back to the manual, like Dami said. And um, some time back, I, I, I was asked to speak at a women conference. And the title of the, I mean, the theme of the program was The Helper. The of the Lord took me back to um, Genesis. And I needed to just um, hear a bit of some of the things that the Lord wanted to point out to me. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says, God created man in his name. He created he, him. In our particular, male and female created. Yeah, Pastor I'm Kenny, sorry. sorry, you are muted. Yeah, mute. Sorry, I was trying to mute the person talking. Pastor Kenny, you're muted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So I said, um, the first thing I want to talk about is the identity factor. So I said, I'm going back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. The Bible says, God created man in his own image. He created he, him, colon, male and female. Created he, them. So we're not talking about man here. We're talking about both male and female. That moment, God created both man and woman. So the woman was not an accident. She wasn't an afterthought. She wasn't a mistake. She was well planned. She was carefully structured. She wasn't an accident. The moment you realize th this identity place of who you are in God, then your, uh, the awareness of your completeness dawns on you. The second thing I want to talk about is the right factor. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28, the right factor. Now, let me quickly read a few, um, a couple of scriptures. The Genesis chapter 1. Verse 28, and the Bible says, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you, plural, plural, every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which the fruit of the tree is yielding its fruit, it shall be for meat for both of you. Now, I want you to realize that the kind of rights a man has is the same right a woman has. Please don't get it twisted. I'm not saying be bossy. I'm talking about identity here so that once you know your place and where God has placed you, your placement in life, you will not feel less or, or inferior to anybody. I see a lot of women say, I'm finished. It has left me. I'm abandoned. I'm this. And they are, they are falling. Their life is practically falling apart. Like that means said, divorce can come in. Come in. Anything, life can, I mean, life can happen. You can lose your husband. It can, it can work out on the marriage. Anything can happen. The moment you understand your right factor that, okay, God created, I and this man, the same day, gave us the same right give us the same privileges, give us the same authority, then you begin to understand your placement. The Bible says God blessed bless them. And he said, be fruitful, be multiplied. We got the same authority that exact same day. So why then do you think you are less or you are inferior? The third thing I want to talk about is the multiplier factor. I'm still reading Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 verse 29. And the Bible says, I have given unto you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of this. So that day, God gave man and woman that seed of empowerment. So I want every woman here tonight to, to understand the fact that you, you, can, you cannot believe the lie of the devil. Or you cannot wait for validation from another person before you become, before you, you are empowered. I mean, the, the, the game we just played now, I mean, how many, how many women wait for their husband? A lot of us chose 90%. Why are we choosing that? Why are we waiting? Why do we think until the man shows up? Why are we thinking that the man is superior? Why do we think that he has more to offer than you have to offer? Every woman must debunk this lie 
that without a man, you cannot prosper, you cannot multiply, the works of your hands cannot be blessed, or you need validation. All these commandments were given the same day. The fourth factor here is the health factor, and this is where it gets interesting. So God saw that everything he made was good, um, and then he ended creation, and he deployed the two of them. Don't forget that. He said he created he, him, male and female created he, them. And then the next thing is we see the man at his place of assignment, which is at, at the scene, which is at the Garden of Eden. It, then there was um, a deployment. The man went to the garden. He started tending. He started naming the animals. That's some work. That's some high level of work, you know, cleaning the animals, taking care of them, doing this and all of that. Where was the woman at that time? So in the course of study, God deployed man to the Garden of Eden and he deployed to the, the woman to his presence, to his presence. Now, when man eventually, when we, I'll, I'll get back to that. He deployed man to, to the garden and the man started tending, he started taking care of the flowers, he started naming the animal, he started doing this and he started doing that. And then God saw a vacuum and said, hmm, this man looks... Uh, let me say he looks sad. This man looks uh, um, incomplete. This man is lonely. Hear me. The woman was not the one who was lonely. You are not alone. You are not lonely. And I need every woman to hear that. The man, the Bible says that God saw that the man was alone and he decided to complete him. So the moment a woman starts thinking until I get married, until I get a career, until I start having children, until I do this, until I do that, I'm not complete. Then you, you've gotten it all mixed up. The woman was deployed to his presence, the place of worship, the place of comfort, the place of acceptance, regardless of where the man was. So God sent the woman to complete him. Now, the woman wasn't there when God gave man the instruction that he shouldn't touch this, he shouldn't touch that. So you can understand why the woman missed out on it. Women, we are very detailed people. If she was there, I believe what went wrong wouldn't have gone wrong. And every woman must understand that. Now, my question to every one of us tonight is, how has the helper, the person who was sent to help someone, how has the helper now become the helpless? Because marriage happened, God saw that the man was alone. God decided, okay, you know what? I need to send someone to compliment this man. I need to send someone to complete this man. I need to send someone to make life more beautiful for this man. And he looked in the whole of the heavens because that was where she was. That was where she was. And God said, you know what, woman? Can we send you on this task? Can you do this for us? Can you go help him? Can you... Can you use the genius in you? Can you use the expertise in you and complete this man? Women, regardless of whatever you're going through, whether you're married, whatever life has thrown at you, there is a genius in you that God has put in there. What are you doing with that genius? I want to ask you tonight. What are you doing with it? You are not alone. You've never been alone. You will never be alone. You are complete. Now, Regardless of what we are going through, every woman must be able to interpret the seasons of our life. Don't see your waiting season as a wasting season. I'll take that again. Don't see your waiting season as a wasting season. Rather, invest into it. Use the genius in you. Use the genius in you to create something to create something. Now, let me paint a picture. Let me tell you why a lot of women, I went through it in the marriage. You see, Mark was doing his thing. He was naming the animals, he was rushing everything. Around. We women come into the scene and we think we can change the rules. We think we can change the rules. And then the man keeps watching, okay. Okay, so she can drive the children to school. Okay, fine, if she can do it, then go ahead and do it. You know, men, the man just stayed back. And then we women, we come again, and the, and the uh, our strength is running. That happens a lot here in Nigeria. Women have become something else. We are rendering the men uh, handicapped. We are making them uh, not to fit in into the, the role and the assignment that God has given them. We are supposed to be a help meet. Bible says that we send him a help meet. I will help him to meet up. 
So you're not supposed to go there and take the whole of the whole thing from him and say, okay, you know what, you stay back and let me take it off. By the time you do that and things begin to happen, you now, you now become, you now start feeling inadequate. You now start feeling lonely. And then you go like, you were not like this before. Why did you do this? And the man goes like, three weeks ago, you took the kids, you went to the market, you cleaned that out. So why can't you do it now? Now, the moment you have that misplaced priority and you leave your place of assignment, which is the place where God has sent you to complement, then we begin to feel inadequate of ourselves. Marriage is not the ultimate. Seen a lot of things in 25 years. I want you to know a lot of women are out there happily married. Wow, well done, great. But trust me, most times our blueprint does not match our, 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 I mean, the kind of plan we had for ourselves. The current reality, the current reality, most times doesn't match the blueprint. The current reality, because you are like, by now, I expect that we should have done this. By now, I expect that we should have done that. Most times, most times, trust me, the current reality does not match the blueprint. Marriage is not the ultimate. When God created man, women, men and female, he deployed man to the Garden of Eden. He deployed a woman. He deployed the woman to his presence. The place of his presence is the place of strength, is the place of, 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 of identity, is the place of actualization, is the place where you, you are whole. And the moment you move down, you step down from that, that point of acceptance and you are, you are seeking acknowledgement or validation from other sources. Trust me, you're going to mix it all up. Okay. Um, the next thing I'll just like to talk about is that, um, I mean, uh, Minister Edna said it, Genesis chapter 29, verse 31 and 35, Leah did everything to get her husband's attention. Several times, a lot of women, we do a whole lot of things to get our boss's attention and all of that. And it's like, our best is not even good enough. We are not even there yet. She had the first child and she said, oh, my husband will love me. And he wasn't even loving her. In fact, she was becoming more irritated. He was becoming more irritated. The next thing, she had another one and said, oh, I've seen that my husband hates me. I believe that with this, God will console me. And that wasn't even happening. The third time she had another child and she said, now I'll be joined with my husband. When she saw that for each step she was trying to do to please life, her husband, her boss, to please her neighbors, to please whoever, she discovered she was getting farther away from his presence. The last time she had a son, she said, you know what, Lord, <laughs> that became a game changer for her. And she said, now my, I am having a mind shift I will praise the Lord. The place of praise for women is a place of strength. 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 Now, as a woman, you are so many things to so many people. You are first a daughter. I mean, you have a dad. You didn't come jump from anywhere. You have a daughter. You are a daughter. Um, you are a sibling. You have brothers and sisters. You are, a, you, are a, um, you, are a, um, you are a spouse, a companion, you are a wife, you are a friend to some people. You are friends, a lot of us are here, we're friends. You're a friend, you're a neighbor, you are a boss if you're an entrepreneur, or you're an employee somewhere, you know. Uh, there's so many things to so many people. The fact that one aspect of your life has failed does not mean that every other part needs to go down the drain. Trust me, even if you're, you've lost your husband, the rent is going to come knocking at the end of the year. The children's school fees will come. The needs and the things that you desire will come. So why are you falling apart? Why are you, why are you, why are you, why are you going through what you're going through? I'm sorry, I, I just want to inject us with one kind of faith tonight that as we leave this meeting, we are not going to go back the same way. We are not going to go back into pity party. Oh God, why? Trust me, worry will do nothing. Uh, anxiety will do nothing. It will only affect us more. We can see the statistics there. Women will die of heart disease. Women will die of, of um, um, cervical cancer and all of that. We don't take care of ourselves. We take care of everybody. We don't take care of self. Now, I'm using the same illustration. If we need to cook soup, we are women. We cook very well. Do you know that here in Nigeria, you can cook a soup for 1,000 naira? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you can cook a soup for 500 naira. You can cook, cook um, a soup for 50,000 naira, depending on how much you have to invest in that pot of soup. But trust me, every other ingredient can be missing in that pot. There's only one thing that cannot be missing. 
I don't know if somebody can tell me. Can you go to the chat room and tell me? Let me see whether I have intelligent women here. One thing that, that can't be missing in that pot of soup. Can we go to the chat room quickly? I want to make this quite interactive. Okay, I think I got the first person. The first person said, so, thank you. So it doesn't really matter if you don't have meat. It doesn't really matter if you don't have um, a, um, sauce. It doesn't really matter if you don't have uh, curry and thyme. Trust me, if salt is missing, that soup is tasteless. You are the salt. You are the one that we have added flavor to your life. You are the seasoning. You are the juice. You are the, you are the blessing. You that I'm speaking to tonight. Every other thing can be missing. Every other thing can be missing. You can take your okra and you know, scoop it without mama, without meat, without turkey or whatever. But salt cannot be missing. And the Bible says, if the salt loses its taste, where will it shall it be salted? So trust me, you can think you're going to find it in the marriage. And trust me, it's not going to be there. You can think you're going to find it in a career. I was in the banking industry for 10 years. The day I had to leave my job, it was as if the whole world was crashing down on me. You might be waiting for the fruit of the womb for years and years and nothing is happening. So my question is, there where you are, I want you to know that you are complete based on this factor, the identity factor, amen, the identity factor, the right factor, the multiplier factor, and the health factor, the health factor. So you have so many things to so many people, but if you allow one aspect of your life to turn you into um, 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 a, a sad person, there's a father out there who is looking out for your welfare. There's a brother out there, your children are there. Okay, <laughs> I don't know because of time, somebody wanted to know why I said he was deployed to God's presence. Now, why he said that is because if you read the preceding verses, the Bible says that God created man. He created him. Male and female created he them. Male and female created he them. The man was deployed to the Garden of Eden. We saw him doing his work and doing his thing there. Where did the woman come from? When it was time for woman to show up, the Bible says he just caused the man to sleep and he formed something and he, and he brought the man out of the woman. The woman didn't just fall from the sky. So she was in a place of comfort and acceptance first to let you know that regardless of what you go through, there is, there is a God up there who validates you. That's what, I'm, that's what I mean, who validates you. Okay, so just, you, you cannot afford to lose your soul. You cannot afford to lose your, your taste. You cannot afford to lose your ginger, like Nigerians will say. You can't afford to lose your ginger. You can't afford to lose it. Okay, you can't afford to lose it. When life happens, are you going to emerge from whatever life has thrown at you or you'll be submerged? The moment you are submerged, you cannot walk in the fullness of the reality of your calling. I've discovered over the years, when I left the banking industry, I mean, I was broke, I didn't have money and everything, and I'm like, God, is this it? I wept and wept, and I tried not do anything until I pulled in into the recess of my being and I asked myself, Lord, I was first before you, in your presence, before you brought me into this earth. Lord, what next? Every woman must be able to ask herself that question, what next? What is my NBT? What is my next big thing? You must be able to ask yourself for everything so that you can evolve, so that your life can evolve, so that because you lost your husband or you lost a child or because you lost your job, then that's the end of it. No, that shouldn't be. That shouldn't be the case with you. I don't know if I'm communicating to someone tonight. That shouldn't be the, the case with you. You are supposed to evolve. You're supposed to emerge. When I left that, back my banking career, my life was torn about the, the, the fame, the, 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 the glamour and the glitz and all of those things that were there. All friends, shh, gone. Those things I put my trust in, gone. And then I went back and I said, Lord, what next? In the place of prayer, drawing from my place of strength, the originality of my identity, I asked God, Lord, what next? And God said to me, you know what? what, what is, he just asked me a question. What is that thing you, you just love to do? I, I started thinking about it. I said, I love children. And he said, you're going to start a school. And I'm like, I don't have money. And he said, I have given unto you all things that pertain to life and godliness. And thank you, Dami, for saying it. That most times, while you're still thinking about it, trust me, another person is already planning. While you are planning, another person is already executing. 
another person is already executing. So I said, Lord, if you tell me to start, what do I, what do, I do? And then Second Kings chapter 4 came to my mind. What do you have in your house? Women, we are quick to com com conclude that we have nothing. The widow said the same thing. She said, I have nothing um, except. Can we try and find out what those exceptions are? Can we try and find out where we've kept those things that we think can no longer work for us? Okay, because you're a nursing mother, is that the end of you? She said, okay, I remember, I think I have one pot of oil somewhere. Uh, let me check where is it. Can you dig up your life and find out what those things, those treasures that the Lord has put on the inside of you? Can we dig it out tonight? Can we redefine you? Can you evolve? Can you emerge into, what, into the reality that God wants for you? If your, if your blueprint is not, if your current reality is not matching your blueprint, can we re-strategize by the help of the Holy Spirit and bring out the best in this woman? Every one of us here. Can we, can we do that? And then I said to the Lord, Lord, I'm ready. And God said, start with what you have. We had a church building then. And I'm like, okay, church is, is um, Sunday services alone. The evening services we do are weekly services that starts from five, sometimes six till eight. So practically that space is empty, is a waste. I mean, during the week. Can we try and find out those things that you think are lying waste? And can we begin to utilize them? Can we begin to? And today, this is 10 years down the line, I started the school. I have a student population of over 200 that are under my watch and care to the glory of God. What do you have in your hand? That's the question I'm asking. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to say, as I'm rounding up, I really wish I had um, a lot more time to share a few things with us tonight. Um, don't forget that you're salt and you're the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. There is no hiding place for you. You are a golden... Hello, Pastor Kenny. We've lost your video. I think she's having some connection issues. Let me send her a message. Just give her a few more minutes. If it doesn't work, we'll let her finish, round up her message. Just um, real quick while we're waiting. Um, I, Pastor I, Kenny. I, I, I had a question for Pastor Kemi. Uh, this is oh, Major sorry. Ed. We have the Q&A at the end, if you don't mind. Um, we, oh, we, end. Uh, oh, we're okay. going to take it um, online, please. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it, Major Andy. Thank you. All right. So, Pastor Kenny, um, all right. So, what I'm going to do right now, while we wait for Pastor Kenny, um, Dr. Fumi, if you can just get ready, I'm going to share my screen real quick to our resource page. Uh, let me see. Um, you can go back to the slide though. You can either um, take a picture of the QR code or put this in and you can ask your questions. What you do, if you go in, you will not see the screen. The screen you see will be more like, um, let, me, let me stop uh, my, um, let me stop, hold on. Can you all see my screen? Okay, this yes. is my own screen, but you have the, uh, if you go to the q and I'm gonna go back to the, the browser here real quick. Sorry, you we should... can't see your screen. We're not seeing your screen. You can see we my screen, see all right, screen. thank you. So you have the opportunity to ask- Sorry, we screen. cannot show you your screen. Oh, oh, you cannot see my screen, I apologize. No, yes, we can't see your screen, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I was here, I can see your screen cannot see your screen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice if I hit share. All right. Thank you. Um, you can ask your questions online. Go back to slido.com and put in this um, 93811. What will pop up for you? Let me take this um, down. Uh, this is, I'm going to take, you, you're going to see yours. Let me um, show you how you're going to see yours. You're going to have your, or you can go to AFAV. Let me go back to the AFAV site. If you go back to the resource here, uh, so go to the resource page. My bad, interactive session page. 
you should be able to type in your question. You can type in, in anonymously. We have some questions waiting. And if you have any question, please put it. If you want to ask a specific speaker, you can put the name of the speaker, or if you just want to make it general, start asking your questions. We are going to go to these questions at the end of the of the uh, presentations. Then one thing I'll say real quick while um, Dr. Fumi, um, she'll be going on next. And Pastor Kenny, whenever you get back at the end, I'll let you conclude your message. That was a very powerful one. So if you go to afavnp.org, um, I'm gonna put in the chat. Or if someone can help me put it, type it in because um, multitasking is a little bit tasking. <laughs> As we that's what women do most times we multitask so i'm going to be going to a different screen um sorry you can't see me for now and nikke is attending to her baby typical life okay. of a woman oh, I'm I'm back, actually okay thank you nikke please put in the link if you go to the afbb np i'm going to just show you our page now the resource page uh if you go to the resources page and these are the free ads um these businesses are or things are owned by people here Pastor Kenny, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Thank you. I'll let you round up. Um, sorry, I knew you, your, your, uh, okay, you know what? Let me let you continue. Then we'll visit this. Let me stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Okay, I'm actually just rounding up. So what makes you, thank you very much. What makes you complete? You know, like I said, I'm just looking at a, a different dimension of charging the women here tonight so that when we leave this conference, you know, um, something in us, can be set up for productivity and we can shift from where we are to where God wants us to be, to where God wants us to be. Okay, so I, I have a quote in my 3D Woman book. Um, not, it is not in, it's actually not in my book, but in one of my courses. I call it the PEDO code, P-E-R-D-O. So if you can write it down quickly, you can just write it down, P-E-R-D-O. Now, the first thing is, what makes you complete is his presence. That's the P. Thank you very much, P-E-R-D-O. His presence, which was what I illustrated when I was sharing the fact that he, he was actually deployed to God's presence. How do you see yourself? His presence will change your awareness of yourself. The way you see yourself, the way you comport yourself, the way you carry yourself. Imagine you are the you are the you are the uh, the daughter you are, you are the daughter of Joe Biden. You know the way you carry yourself. There is this thing in you that my father is the president of the United States of America. My father is this. My father is that. There is a courage that you will have as a result of his presence. The awareness that comes from you. Colossians two ten says we are complete in him. There is a completeness. There is a wholeness that is, it gives you. The Bible says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Like I said, if you were to describe yourself in one word, how do you describe yourself? I describe myself as a multidimensional woman. I don't believe that there is anything a man can do that I cannot do. Trust me, especially in, this, in, in, this, in the times that we are in where there is no distinct work for a man or a woman. You see a lot of women going to IT. You see a lot of women doing a lot of um, uh, they've, they've, they've broken borders. They've, uh, they've, they've been able to, there's, there's no definition of what a, a man can do or what a woman can do. So his presence changes the whole game for you. Number two, your essence. Do you know your true essence and your work? Every woman must know her strengths, her weaknesses, her opportunities, and her threats. Every woman must know. I call it the SWOT analysis. I call it the SWOT analysis. You must perform that SWOT analysis on yourself from time to time. What was a threat to you five years ago? I mean, what wasn't a threat to you five years ago might be a threat to you. Mm -hmm. That's why we encourage women to also do medical checks and all of this and all of that. Just last month, I did the whole run through on myself, mammogram. And not, we can't afford to be careless because we take care of everybody. We don't take care of ourselves. You know, every woman must learn to take a selfie. I usually don't know how to take a selfie, but when you're taking a selfie, you're actually looking at the image until you get the right um, picture or the, the right image. You don't, you don't click. You're looking at yourself. Is my hair well? What are my eyes? My pose? My, my shoe? Is my body showing? Is this showing? Every woman must trust us to always have 
self sessions for ourselves. Your essence means the quality of something that determines your character. Once you know your essence, it will be a game changer for you and you will not need validation from anyone. Number three, our reference. Remember, Eve became a reference point for Adam's completeness. The old of heaven thought, who can we send? They could have sent an angel to empower him, to give him strength to be able to do what he needed to do or just to keep him company and after a while, we let him go. But she became a reference point. She, she was in demand. She was highly recommended. In your home, in your family, in your street, in the things that you do, can you be highly recommended? There are a lot of people that Oprah Winfrey will reach that I will not be able to reach. And there are a lot of people that I will reach that Oprah Winfrey cannot reach. So you need to discover where God can use you as a point of reference. D, defense. God is your defense. And I want to say this, women, we will stumble. Women, we will make mistakes or we have made mistakes. But God is ready to pick you up where you are and get you back on your feet. Get you back on your feet. Whatever it is, put it behind you. Heal. You need to heal from that relationship. You need to heal from that marriage. You need to heal from that betrayal. The moment you heal, you shut the door behind a past and then you face a future that is ahead of you, a future that is ultimately greater than where you're coming from. And then, oh, your obedience. Obedience is what will tie it all up. So God says, um, start reaching out to children in your community, um, and then you're wondering, oh, who will listen to me? Obedience, they say, is always better than sacrifice. Once you find your place of assignment, go ahead and obey God. You can actually literally close your eyes, have a blindfold on, and go all out and obey. Obedience will keep you relevant in the sight of God. So my prayer today for every woman is that you will find your essence. My prayer today for every woman is that you will not wait for validation from anyone. You will not wait until someone charges you on because you know that you are his. You've been able to define who you are. You have a clear um, uh, you, have, you have clarity on your identity. Trust me, being complete is not even something you can debate. It's not something you can debate. Thank you very much, Tim Tope. It's not something you can debate. My prayer today is that his presence will make all of the difference as you walk in your true essence. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. I hope you got something. Thank you, Elza. Thank you, everyone. Wow, thank you, Pastor Kenny. Uh, Nikki, I think over to you. Are you available now? Yes, I am available. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dr. Ekins. We are really blessed by the words that you just um, shared with us. Thank you so much. Uh, the, next, the next item on the agenda is um, our fourth guest, which is Dr. Homi. Uh, oh yes, Chile. I hope I'm right. <laughs> Please pardon me if I'm not. Yeah, so we would like to invite you over to bless us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Nike. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you good. Okay, good. Uh, first, I would like to thank God for um, this opportunity and for the gift of life to be able to, um, you know, join this program, especially with everything that is going on today. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers for the program. Sister Elsa, thank you so much for um, giving me this opportunity to be a blessing and to be blessed. I've been blessed so far with all the speakers. Uh, we thank God for that. And I would like to thank my husband uh, for his support and encouragement during while preparing for this program. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about mental health and the complete woman. I will be using a couple of Bible verses because um, I believe that's very important, and that's how I have tried to I've tried to build my life around that. Um, so the first Bible verse I would like to read is Third John one two, um, and it's go it reads, "Beloved, I be I pray that you may prosper." in all things and being health just as your soul prospers. So this tells me that God's, God wants us to be in good health and this includes mental health. And until we are healthy in all areas of our lives, um, we cannot be complete. 
So the theme for today is what makes a woman complete? And um, all the other speakers have talked about, you know, what do you think when you think about a complete woman? You know, you think about career goals, you know, completing your education, starting a new career as a woman. You think about, oh, working towards, towards that promotion. Um, you know, we think about spiritual goals. Sister Elsa is helping me with the slides. Um, <laughs> You think about spiritual goals and, you know, your spiritual goals could be, you know, because of how busy we are as women, your spiritual goals could be, oh, you know, I want to just have time to be able to read my Bible for maybe like 20 minutes a day, be able to say a prayer in the morning, you know. Um, so those, those might be your spiritual goals. Um, you could think about marital goals, you know, oh, I want to be married by a certain age, especially in our society where, like Dami was saying, you're 27 while you're not married, you know, so, you know, that could be also a marital goal. It could also be, you know, with be busy, being busy with work, being busy with family, you want to have time for your children to be able to, oh, you know, especially as they grow older, you want to be able to, they call you and you're like, oh, I'm busy here. Yeah, so you want to be able to find time for that. And, you know, academic goals, you want to study for your exam, you want to get all A's in your class. And, you know, you may also think about marital goals, like uh, material goals, like, you know, I want to buy a house, I want to buy a car. But one um, goal that I think we rarely think about or is mental, mental goals or mental health. We rarely think about that. Um, so we're going to talk about that today because I think it's a part of being a complete woman. So we're going to talk about first what is health. So the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And it's not merely, merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So this means that without disease or sicknesses such as diabetes or hypertension, you can, you can still not be in health, which this is why mental health is an important part of our overall health. Next, we're gonna talk about what is mental health. So um, the World Health Organization, again, defines the mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own ability can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productive, productively and fruitfully, and is able to contribute to ease of our community. So, and according to the CDC, this includes our emotional, our psychological, and well-being. So our mental health, it affects how we think, how we feel, how we act. It determines how you handle stress. It determines how you relate to each other. It determines how, you know, you're upset at something and your child is there crying. It determines how you re relate to the child. It determines how you relate to, you know, uh, a uh, co-worker at work, how you, how you answer questions. It determines, and it also relates to how we make healthy choices. You know, if, if you could be depressed one day and you know, oh, I have a goal of, I want to lose weight, but because of your mental status at that point in time, you choose to eat a whole pint of ice cream instead of eating the salad that you want to eat. So our mental health affects us in every area of life. It affects every stage of life from childhood to adolescence through adulthood. It affects us in every way. Um, so the American Psychiatric Association um, says um, defines mental illness. Now we're gonna look at what is mental illness. It is defined as a health condition evolving changes in emotion thinking or behavior or a combination of this. And there are mental illnesses that are associated with distress and problems functioning in social work, work or family activities. So why is mental health important for overall health? Um, it is important because especially when you're looking at depression, it increases the risk for many types of physical health problems, um, particularly lung conditions lasting conditions like stroke and type two diabetes. So an individual who is depressed will not be intentional about the types of food he or she eats. And this is me giving an example. So some individuals, when they are depressed, they eat a lot of junk food. Some people don't eat. 
and some people and most some people had said uh sanitary which means they stay in one place you know there's the picture of you know you see a couch potato they just sit there and you know they're eating chips they're eating potatoes they're eating the ice cream they're eating chocolate and you know they sleep a lot and this can lead to weight gain and you know this increases the risk for type 2 diabetes and heart disease so your mental health can affect your physical health also, your physical health can also affect your mental health. For example, somebody that was, God forbid, you know, just um, diagnosed with something like um, cancer or diabetes, that affects how you think because you're, it's not something you're expecting. It's a life change. So um, that can affect um, your mental health. Um, there's a Bible verse that I, will, that, uh, that I would like to read. It's from Proverbs 17, verse 22, and it says, a I'm looking, reading the King James Version, New King James Version, and it says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. So the Bible is also talking about how, you know, meant, um, a good heart, a good spirit is good for us. Um, so actually nowadays when we're looking at um, COVID-19, COVID-19 has increased um, mental illness, well, me as increased mental illness as um, things is started, mostly due to loneliness, you know, it has caused a lot of depression, you know, a lot of people are not used to staying at home, not being able to travel, not being able to go anywhere. So this has caused a lot of people to have, a, um, to be depressed. Um, I will talk about what causes mental illness. Um, so there's really no single cause for mental illness, it's a bunch of uh, factors. It could be like life events, like, you know, you just had a baby, you, you just went from being single to married, and then you just had a baby. That can also, that's, what, that's something called postpartum depression, because it's like you go from, oh, you can sleep whenever you want to a baby crying every hour, and that can lead to depression in some women. You know, you can, it can be, it can be from maybe you witness a vi violence that happened, or maybe, you know, somebody, a, a close friend to you tells you a story about what happened about a violence that happened to them that can also affect you um you know um experiences too such as um chronic diseases as i have mentioned earlier can also lead to um, mental illness like cancer diabetes hypertension um biological factors such as chemical imbalances in the brain so that's one thing you know when you're looking at depression if you ask a psychiatrist they will say oh it's a chemical imbalance in the brain it's due to serotonin and norepinephrine so um that's one reason why we can say that causes mental illness we could also say use of alcohol and recreational drugs you know when you are high in any of these things that's when you start seeing two people and that's when you start seeing things that are not there. Um, and long-term use of that can affect the brain and it can lead to mental illness. Having few friends, um, not being social um, can also be a cause of mental illness because then you feel lonely and then when you're feeling lonely, random things, thoughts come into your mind. What they say that I do mind is the devil's play playground. So, you know, you don't have people you're talking to you by yourself. That's when random thoughts come in. And next thing you know, you're dealing with different things that you're not supposed to deal with. So uh, I'm rushing. So we're going to go to how can we maintain good mental health? Um, the first thing I would say is trust God. Um, God was the one that created you. So um, with whatever situation you're going through, whatever may be causing distress or anxiety, trust God with it. Um, he's the one that knows you from the beginning. So I'm going to read Proverbs 3 from verse 5 to 8. Um, actually, it says, verse 3 says, First five says, trust God with all your heart and lean on, out on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Verse seven says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Verse eight says, it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. The um, last part is what um, is what I want to emphasize on. It says it will be health to your, to your flesh. The... In, uh, contemporary English version in verse eight says, this will make you healthy. So if you trust God with all that is going on, is it, oh, um, 
you know, you wake up, you want to start your day, you're a student, you're worried about your classes, trust God, pray about that day, that that day is going to go well, because he knows you. You're a mother, you know, you have, oh, I have to drop the kids off at daycare. I have to go to, I have to go to work. I have to deal with this bus. I have to, then you come back, you have to deal with your husband. Oh, prepare, prepare food for me. I'm hungry. You know, trust God that the day is going to go well. Then um, number two is you have to stay positive. Watch what you allow into your thoughts, especially when you're alone. Um, Proverbs 4, 23 says, Carefully, this is the contemporary English version. It says, carefully guard your thoughts because they are the source of life. So your thoughts are what, uh, your thoughts are what determines what you do. Your thoughts are what determines how you feel. You know, you somebody, and that, that's where the, the term resilience comes from. Somebody who is thinking, oh, um, I didn't pass that exam. And you know, from there you go, you th start thinking, you're not, I'm not good in anything. God forbid, you know, you're a failure. That that leads down, that starts leading down to a, it leads to a downward spiral into depression and then leads to other things. But but somebody who sees, okay, I failed that exam. You know what? I will try my best next time. You know, God said I'm the head, I'm not the tail. And you know, you start. Re, um, inspiring yourself that makes somebody for somebody who is resilient. Um, the Bible says in Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says, be anxious for nothing, but in prayer, but if by in everything, by prayer and supp supplication with thanksgiving, make your request be known to God. So stay positive. Things happen, especially as women, we're pulled left, right, and center. You know, your husband wants your attention, your um, your children want your attention at work. They want your attention. Your parents are calling you. So stay positive. Don't be anxious. Put everything to God. Leave, put every, leave everything to God in prayer. And he'll make sure that everything aligns well for you. And um, the third one, to maintain good mental health is exercise. Um, regular physical ex activity and exercise can help reduce anxiety and improved moods. I don't know if anybody has exercised. You know when you exercise, you feel happy all oh, because of all the endorphins are running out in your um, system. So um, that's why exercise is a good thing. You feel you feel down, you feel low. Exercise it help it helps. Um, get enough sleep. Um, I know for me that helps. Actually, if I get a bad news or something, if something happens, I just I just go sleep if I'm able to. At that point in time, I go sleep, and by the time I wake up, I'm it's as if nothing happened. I'm better for it. Um, and uh, the fifth one says connect with others. You know, call your friends, talk the situation out. Um, the Bible in Proverbs 12, 25 says, um, anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression, but a good word makes it better, glad. So you don't know who you're going to talk to that is going to give you a good word, that is going to um, cheer you up. You don't know who you're going to talk to, who is going to um, maybe give you a solution to that situation that you're going to. Maybe you have so many things that you do that you have for the day. You don't know who's going to talk, and it's giving you anxiety. You don't know who you're going to talk to that will help you arrange your day in such a way that it makes everything better, in such a way that reduces your anxiety. So connect with others, talk to people. I know in this day and age, we're so busy with everything, but maybe you're coming back from work. That's what I do. On my way back from work, that's when I call friends, that's when I call family, because I know once I get inside the house, my phone is never on me. I don't know where it is. So, you know, on the way back, call people, talk to people and connect with others, check up on others too. Um, verse uh, number six is set priorities. Um, don't become overwhelmed by creating a life-changing list of things to achieve while you're home. So you have a bunch of things you want to do. So write them down and number them one to one to ten. Which one is the most important to get to be done for today? If 
you don't, and then, you know, you number them down. If you don't get to number six, you know that, fine, I didn't get to number six today. Tomorrow is another day, and you try to get it done. Set reasonable goals for each day and outline the steps you want to take to reach those goals. Don't, you know, and when you do that, you it reduces your anxiety. And then if it becomes to a point where you are not able to handle it, then speak to a therapist, speak to a counselor, speak to your pastor, speak to somebody that, um, or speak to a professional that will be able to help you. And um, so what does this mean for us to be complete? Um, it means take time for yourself. You have to trust God to pray. It means you have to take time. So take time for yourselves. In order to do any of these things on how to maintain mental health, you have to take time for yourself. If it means exercising while the baby is napping, or it means, you know, before you go home, you, you run straight to the gym and do like a quick 20 minute workout. You have to take time for yourself. Um, you have to, if he's driving, uh, like I said earlier, praying while driving, um, you take time for yourself. And um, I believe that's where I stopped. No, some Bible verses, actually, I'm sorry. Some Bible verses that I actually use when, you know, life is coming at me. I have four um, that I would want that you, you can write down, um, that I dwell on. So I have Jeremiah 29, 11, and that's the one that um, talks about um, God. We know the plans God has for us, that thoughts of good and not of evil. So especially when I get, uh, you know, I don't like in school, you don't pass an exam. I use that a lot because I know, you know, I know God has expected hand for me and, you know, that helps me move on. Um, another one is Philippians 4, 6 to 7. And that's the one that says, be anxious for nothing, but in, but in everything by prayer and supplication. So with that one, I start singing praises and I start, you know, worshiping God and I put everything in his hands and try not to worry about it. Then 1 Peter 5, verse 7 says, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. So I know that no matter what's happening, I know God cares for me. No matter any situation, no matter, oh, my boss talked to me somehow and they are making me feel a certain way. I know God cares for me. So I put, like Sister Edna says, I put, I put God in the center of everything. And so that makes that reduces whatever anxiety or depression or distress that may be going on at that same time, that reduces it. And then there's Ecclesiastes 3, and that's the one that says there's a time for everything and there's a season for everything. So you just pray and ask, what's this, what this situation, like surely when, if, you're, if you're a newborn mother, this, this, that's a season right now. So that shouldn't make me it's going to have, it's going to come with anxiety. It's going to come with distress, but that's a season. And I know that once I pass that season, like Jeremiah 29, 11 says, everything, everything works together for my good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fumi. Uh, I really want to apologize because I realized that when I was introducing you, I did not say your bio so <laughs> i'm just gonna say, i'm just gonna say quickly you know i'm just gonna read through it quickly so that people will know you yeah better so dr fumi is a nigerian born american who completed her medical education and obtained her md from the american university of antigua she's a daughter sister wife and mother who is dedicated to the well-being of everyone around us around her, sorry. Uh, Dr. Fumi has a keen interest in mental health and overall. She's the daughter of Zion who holds kingdom work close to her heart. So just want, I just want to apologize and then I want to say thank you so much for bringing this word to us because um, mental health is, is, is a big thing, most especially during this period of pandemic and all that. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for sharing the knowledge with us. So the next item, Sister Elsa. So it's going to be. I need to just go ahead and introduce the last speaker, then we'll go over everything okay. at the end. Thank you. 
Okay, the last speaker for this program is Minister Patient Sarumi. Um, Minister Patient Sarumi is an HR generalist with many years of working experience in human resources. She's a professional career coach with a passion for helping and supporting um, individuals with their career journeys. A married mother of two, she has a deep desire to help women manage their careers, transitions at different stages of their lives. Um, Minister Pat is also a trained Christian mentor and coordinator of youth and teenage group in her local church. Please join me as we welcome Minister Patience Sarumi. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate um, that and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to um, speak to you today. Um, just as, a, as an aside, I don't know if you can see the resemblance, but um, Elsa's sister. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And one thing that I've noticed, um, I was attending another program, but I did um, join in at various points, and I noticed that quite a, a, a a number of the speakers had said things that were kind of relevant to what I was looking to say today. So I will say half of my work here has been done. So thank you to all those who have said, and apologies if I repeat something um, someone has said. As I said, I didn't join from the beginning, so I might be repeating, but that just means God, God wants us to hear and he's reinforcing that message. Um, so where the theme for the program is what makes a woman complete. And I'm just going to be looking at redefining your career. Um, one of the things that has been um, said, that I've heard a couple of the speakers talk about is completeness. Self, yeah, so um, completeness is the state or condition of having all the necessary or appropriate um, parts. So when you talk about a woman being complete, you're saying she has everything that is really necessary or relevant for her as a woman. But one of the things that I will want to say and re echo from what others have said is that we find our completeness in Christ. It is um, Christ that makes us whole. And the scripture that I, I would want to reference, I'll read, um, is that um, Colossians 2 verse 10. It says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body, so you are also, also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So um, for us to be able to be complete, it starts with acknowledging Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And one of the things that I remember when I was preparing for this um, message was a song from a children's um, minister, and I will show my age by just mentioning, it's called Donut Man. And there was this song he, he sang, you know, um, in those days that uh, we used to like. He says, and life without Jesus is like a donut because there's a hole in the middle of your heart. So Jesus is what brings the completeness. Without Jesus, it's like there's a hole. And having Jesus is what makes you complete and whole. And without him, everything that we want to do, all our efforts will fall completely flat. So um, generally, when we're talking about um, career, I'm just going to look at a few definitions of career. Um, the dictionary definition is the job or profession that someone does for a long period of their life or the part of your life that you spend working. But when I was um, studying um, to my career coaching course, we had some definitions that I think reflected for me more what I would say career is. And it says it's the evolving sequence of a person's work experiences over time. And the uh, people who defined it, Otto Hall and Lawrence. And the other one that I also liked was sep separate or related experiences and adventures through which everyone passes over their lifetime. And the thing that I love about this definition is that it doesn't just um, talk about your work experience. It says related experiences and adventures which everyone passes over their lifetime. 
So for us as women, a, a, a significant part of our life is um, with bringing up family and children. And for me, that also forms part of your career because it's an important aspect. Someone needs to do it. And we are the ones that have been gifted with that um, ability to do so. So for those women who are homemakers, who spend their lifetime just looking after children, that is your career. And you shouldn't feel any less significant than those who go into work to, to make themselves more uh, productive for one reason or the other. So um, the thing about our career is that for us to find completeness, it's about finding and fulfilling the plan and the purpose of God for our lives. I know a previous speaker was talking about our plan and purpose. And this is because as children of God, whatever career we choose to pursue, the ultimate goal is for us to bring glory to God. And we see that in 1031, which tells us that, um, so whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So in order to give glory uh, um, to God in our careers, we need to use the gifts and the talents that he has given unto us. And he has put something in us that is very um, useful and he wants us to use this to fulfill either a spiritual or a vocational role. And in order to fulfill um, our, our purpose, we need to make sure that we, are, we find out what our gifts and our talents are and we're using them. So for example, someone might have the gift of singing they could choose to use that gift in the church to be a blessing to the body of Christ, or they could use that same voice to also have a career as a musician and earn an income, or they're using the gifts that God has deposited in them. And the gift an, uh, an individual has is different because we're all made uniquely and differently by God. I know, I, I believe I've heard um, one of the speakers mention a few of these scriptures. It says that, so we are wonderfully and we are fearfully made. You know, we are the masterpiece. We are created as masterpieces. So God makes each and every one of us um, different. And those, the scriptures um, that I'm referencing are Psalm 139, verse 13 to 14, and Ephesians 2, 10. The other thing that we see about gifts and talents is that God gives specific things to individuals. And if we look at um, Exodus 31, verse 2 to 6, See where God is giving instructions to Moses about how the Ark of the Covenant should be built, and then the people that he wants to use to build them, Bezalel and Oholiab. And there he's talking about specific gifts and talents that he's giving to them. I'll just read a few of those verses. He says, so it's uh, Exodus 31, 2 to 6. He says, Look, I've specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of her, of the tribe of Judah, I've filled him with the Spirit of God giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. The master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze, is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. So it shows that God is very specific in depositing. Yeah, I can reach the God. Let me have two bags. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, um, I think someone is speaking and it's interfering. Sorry, if you can please mute. Thank you. So God has given each and every one of us specific gifts and talents. And for us to be able to know what these gifts and talents are, we need to go back to him. It's funny, again, when I logged in earlier on, I heard one of the speakers say, um, so she said manufacturer and instructions. I have the exact same words here. It says some of us do not know and cannot fulfill our, our, our full potential because we do not know what God has deposited in us. If we want to understand what our gifts and talents are, we need to first of all, go back to the manufacturer and read the instructions he has provided. He may give you some indicators as you find yourself identifying some traits through the word of God. So again, that's reaffirmation that for us to know who we are and what we are supposed to do, we need to go back to God for directions. Amen. And I was also going to say something about how we can know what our gifts and our talents are. Um, I believe it was also mentioned briefly that sometimes um, people may tell you um, that, oh, you are good in this, or oh, I notice you have this gift in looking after children. I think um, the two speakers back, she mentioned that that's how she knew what to do next. God told her that she's good in looking after children. Another way is that uh, it might be things that we like doing and we are 
we do them consistently. So we might have a gift to do certain things and we are able to do them consistently or it could be about problem solving as well. So these are some of the ways that we can know what our gifts and talents are. So what I'm going to talk about now is how can I kickstart my career after being out of work for a while? Because it's like we're trying to redefine uh, ourselves as women. I think one of the first questions that I would ask is why do you want to work? The other thing that I would say you want to know is what do I want to do? And the third thing is how do I get there? So in terms of why do you want to work? I would say these are like your goals. And for, for different individuals, wanting to work will be different. They will have different reasons for wanting to do so. And why it's important for us to understand why we want to work is that it will give you a focus and direction when you start looking for work. And it can also be useful because the goal can determine if you are able to carry on at work or to move on when things are not going your way. So for example, at the moment we have a pandemic and you see that regardless of what is going on, the doctors and the nurses, they still go back to the hospital to treat people because that is what they believe that they are called to do. I mean, pandemic or no pandemic, they feel they have a, a need to serve us in that area. So knowing what your goal for uh, working is, is very, very important. For some people, they want to work as a means of livelihood. So they are trying to meet their financial aid uh, needs or get a sense of security through work. And in such cases, what they need to do to get back into work, um, they might not really need to use much of their skills. So say, for example, um, we have a need as a family, um, we want to maybe I would say, okay, I will go into work so that I can earn money for us to be able to pay for that school trip. But for that, because it's like a short term, and apologies if my internet um, goes down, I'm seeing signal to say my internet is unstable. It's a short term goal, and you are working just because you want to get something out of it. So for such a thing, if you don't, it's not it's about time. You just want to get into work, make the money, and it's for a purpose. So you might not need to use much of your skills or much of your giftings. And for such things, you might just say, okay, I'm just going to do a job. It could be like maybe a retail job or something where you don't need more skills or where you'll be trained to be able to do the job. But if it's like a case of you wanting to go back into work because you need to earn, then one of the questions you ask yourself is whether you have enough experience to be able to do that role and if it will create an opportunity to be able to earn at a higher level because you've got previous experience. And the situation will be different for different individuals um, because of their life circumstance. For some people, they want to go back into work for social reasons. So in such cases, they just want to develop social interactions and build relationships. And like the previous, again, this might not need a variety of skills and experience. If you are doing it for social reason, there's no need for you to maybe financially, your, your household is okay. Or you just want to make interactions because you've been out of networking for a while for bringing up children and things like that, just okay. You can choose to go and volunteer or you can choose a job that is just maybe convenient for you to get out of the house for a few hours a day. And for such things, you may not necessarily need much skills and it may not necessarily be a paying job. For some people, their reason for wanting to work is because they feel it's a calling. Like the example I gave for the nurses and the doctors, they feel they are called to, to an act of service, to serve or to fulfill a need in society. And that's what they are doing is beneficial. And working gives them a sense of satisfaction. And for such things, again, you might need experience to be able to do it. You might need to get a qualification, especially when you're looking at things like the medical field, or, or, or such areas. So that reason, again, is a different one. Some people might choose to go back to work for personal development. I just want to develop new skills or I want to build on the existing one. Or um, before I had children, I was working as, a, as an admin assistant and now I'm going back to work. I want to develop myself. I want to be an admin manager. So you are looking to build on the skills that you already have. So it's a personal development thing. The thing with all these um, goals is that they can happen to each and every one of us at different points in our lives. 
So it's not that for one person is livelihood. We might find ourselves in different stages of our lives where we're going through one of those things. For some people, when they're getting to the age of retirement, they say, okay, I've done my bits, I've earned a livelihood, and I just want to work for social reasons. So it could vary depending on what stage we're at um, in our life. Then the next question I, uh, I ask is, what do I want to do? And I put in bracket for myself to say, and rea realistically, what can I do? And these are the questions that I would ask. We want to think about what you want to do. You have the skills, qualification, and experience for what you want to do. That's the first thing you need to ask yourself. And then what you want to do, does it tie with your goals from the previous question? Is it to meet or to fulfill a goal? So for example, if my goal is to work because of there's a financial need, as I've said, you could get a, a job in retail or, or places like that. But however, if the goal is personal development, then you want to demonstrate the skills and the experience that you already have. So for such a role, you would have had previous experience. So that means I'm looking for jobs, which kind of flow on. Um, there's, the question can also go further in terms of like, I might want to change career and go into another area, but we'll look at that in a um, subsequent session. So what do I want to do? Do I have skills? Do I have qualifications? Do I have experience? And what I want to do, does it help me to achieve my dreams? So after you've asked yourself those questions, when I say realistically, you need to check yourself. I cannot say I am someone who doesn't have IT skills, but now I want to change careers and I want to become an admin manager. I don't have these skills. It's not that you can't do it, but you need to be realistic. It could be a long-term goal, but if I want to work now, what can I do? And then my long-term goal, I'll need to determine what can I do in the future to get me to the position of an admin manager? So that's why I say we need to be realistic of what we want to do. Um, as I'm addressing women at different stages of their careers, I'd like to give a general overview. And this was one of the challenges I had when preparing because I know there are people of different, at different stages in their careers or at different levels. So in looking at what you want to do, I would ask if you have any particular career aspirations for some of us, maybe after bringing up children and the children have reached the stage where we now have a bit more time for ourselves, we might have had a career goal that we wanted to accomplish in the past and so okay, now I feel like I'm doing this. Now I want to become a nurse, I want to become an accountant and so on. You need to also bear in mind what we've talked about, what I laid as the foundation. So you need to balance your desires to whether you have the gifts, the talents and the skills that are suited to the career that you want to do, or it could lead you to frustration. And I would suggest that um, you try and make inquiries about what you are looking into to, to see what is required, because some things may not particularly sit well with you. For example, I, I look and I say, oh, okay, I, I want to become a nurse, but at the sight of blood, I'm panicking and I'm painting. That doesn't sit well with me, so it will not align with those goals. So those are the kind of things that you want to look at. I want to become an accountant. Do I have a head for numbers? Am I numerically gifted? If no, then that might not be an option for you to look at. The next question you also ask yourself is, do you have any previous relevant qualifications and experience? So I've split um, this slide into two. They could be interrelated, but I, can, uh, I would choose to deal with them as two separate entities, but uh, they could be related. So looking at qualifications, this is one of the routes that you can use to get to where you're going to. Um, in some cases, you might have relevant qualifications. So for example, maybe um, in my first degree, I did uh, microbiology and I want to study nursing. It's a science course, so there's a link. So it could be a relevant qualification because I already have an idea of some of the science related things. In such a situation, what you want to do is for the role that you are looking to do, you might want to contact them to see if that's your qualification that you have. You go any way in helping you towards getting to your goal. So in the qualification routes, you might call them and they say, okay, you have um, 
this microbiology degree. So therefore, for you to be able to work as a nurse, you only need to do X and Y modules in this area, and then you'll be able to practice. So that way, it's opening a door for you. So that way, it's like a qualification route for you to get to where you're going to. And you'll find out that I'm using the UK as an example because I'm based in the UK. There are some careers where you, they, this is actually done. So for example, um, if you want to become a, a lawyer, you can do a first degree in some certain areas that will be accepted and you can say, okay, now I want to get into law. And they will look at your qualification and say, okay, this is related and we are willing to train you alongside you working for you to be able to become a lawyer. But situations may differ depending on the country that you are um, living in. The other thing I would say is if you don't have a relevant qualification, so that's the next point, then do I need to study to get the required qualifications or are there alternative routes? When I wanted to um, do my first uh, postgraduate degree, I went to the university for an open day and I showed them my qualification. My first degree is in microbiology. I wanted to study human resources. They say, yeah, they will accept that I'm not an undergraduate, that I've gone through a first degree. And so therefore I can study human resources at postgraduate level. So it took off some of the things that some people might have had to go through if they did not have a first degree. So that is also another route that you can um, utilize. Then you also need to look at, if you don't have any qualifications at all for what you want to study, you need to go back and start from scratch, you know, and maybe you have just GCSEs or GCE, your highest qualification, then they may tell you that you may need to um, start as a mature adult. I'm sorry, I can't see the comments. I don't want to um, manage the, the chat box while I'm talking, just not to distract um, things, but I'm sure we'll be able to get to the questions later on. So for any form of training that is required, what you need to do is you need to weigh if you can manage the costs that are involved, if you need to go back to do some training in your um, career aspirations, can you afford it? Can you study while working? And or are you willing to start from scratch if you don't have the, the qualifications? Then the other route that you can go through is the experience route. So for some people, maybe they've worked in the past and you have certain skills and experience. And you say, okay, I've spent maybe four years of my life bringing up with children. I want to go back into work. Will my previous experience count in what I want to do? So if you have relevant experience, the question again that I would ask is, is that experience recent? And I'll give you an example. Say for example, before I had children, I had um, IT skills. And maybe at the time I was, uh, before I had my children, they were still the computing language they were using. Pardon me if there are any IT people here and I'm not speaking your language. They were still doing things with MS-DOS and all those kind of things. And you're coming back and now they're using Python and all those kind of language, you know? Would that MS-DOS be relevant in this day and age? You need to be honest with yourself and say, okay, maybe I might have had IT skills, but it's not relevant for today. And for such situations, what um, employers might want to say is that, okay, at least you know Why about you IT. Sorry, someone needs to mute. So um, they would say, okay, at least you are from the IT world and you understand how things work. We're willing to take you on, but maybe at a junior level and you can work your way up because you have some kind of relevant experience. If the answer is no, and you don't have relevant experience in that area, you might have to go back to the qualification route, which, are, which is why I said it can be interrelated for the two. The other thing that I would say is that um, if you have worked previously and you're looking to change careers to something entirely different, there's something that we call transferable skills. So the transferable skills are like skills that you can take from one role and move to another role. They may not necessarily be um, um, related, but what the new employer is looking for is similar. So let me give an example. Um, transferable skills are things like maybe team working, um, ability to, to negotiate and influence and things like that. So maybe in your job, you were working as a manager in uh, maybe a, a phone company or something like that. 
and now you say, okay, you want to translate and become an office manager in a totally different environment. So maybe you want to work within the uh, business field and you want to become an office manager. So what you would do is you look at your CV and look at the job description and see if there are things that they are asking. You should be able to um, manage staff. You did that in your previous role. That's transferable. You should be able to use um, IT equipment. You have admin skills. Oh, that's a transferable skills. So you can, you can transfer those skills and you can use it to change career. It works in some industries. It doesn't work in all industries. But we can get advice and guidance and that's what people like me are here for. Then some of you may also want to choose to use experiences that you gained either during the course of your life when you were a parent or something like that. Some of you, while you were at home, you helped maybe your friends to look after their children and they were always pleased with how you looked after the children. That's a skill. You might say, okay, maybe I want to go into childcare. That's a transferable skill. You say, oh, while I was looking after children, I used to help my neighbors to manage their children. While they were there, I used to teach them and things like that. It's something that you can use to demonstrate, although you were not at work. There are other things that we do, which may be voluntary. So for example, you work in the church, uh, you're a volunteer, maybe you're an usher, you used to count offering and things like that. And you want to go into retail. You can say, okay, I've managed counting of money. When I was a volunteer in the church as an usher, I used to do this. It's showing um, relevant experience. So these are some of the ways that we can use our experience to, to manage our careers. So the other thing there is that there are some of us who maybe because we started bringing up children, we don't have any experience whatsoever. Again, back to that question, am I willing to start from scratch? You need to be honest with yourself and open. You say, okay, look, I don't really have anything that I want to do and I'm willing to work my way up. And in such cases, I would suggest that you look for roles where employers are willing to train you into the role. And then when you get in, you begin to show your diligence. And the Bible says that a man's gift to make room for him. And that's in that way you can progress and develop a career from nothing. Don't look down on the two beginnings. That's what the Bible also tells us. The other thing that I would uh, go back to in terms of um, relevant skills and experience that we might have gotten from home or from work. Say, for example, while you were at home, um, you used to, um, you, are, you are good with hospitality and when you cook, people com compliment you on your food, things like that. That might be an option for you. You might say, okay, I want to go into business and I want to cater. I will go back again to the being realistic. In being realistic, you ask yourself, if someone should come to me and say, can you cater for a party of 100 people? Can you really do it? So it's not about watching people and wanting to be like them, but you be realistic with yourself about what is possible. If that's not possible for you to do, then maybe you can join up with someone who is already doing the business and say, okay, look, you know how to cook uh, maybe yam porridge or something. If you have an event, can I join you maybe to help? Or I can come and support you with your cooking when you're doing your cooking. There are options there. The other thing I, I would also say is that in terms of business, you can also do um, marketing. You can market things like, I've done it before. I was an, uh, I used to sell Avon, I sold Mary Kay. You hear people selling things like Forever Living, and things like that. So there are options available to you to be able to re reinvent yourself and get yourself back into the world. And I would say for the one about selling the Avon and all that, that would be wonderful for, for people who would just want to socialize or just network and build up, but don't have the time, maybe because their children are still young, that would be a good opportunity for you. So moving on, in terms of you wanting to move on with your career, this is the scripture I would just ask us to look at, is Luke 14, 18, uh, 28 to 30, and it talks about counting the cost. It says, is there anyone here who, Planning to build a house doesn't first sit down and figure the cost so you know if you can complete it. If you only get the foundation laid and then run out of money, you're going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun at, at you. It started with something you couldn't finish. The reason why I said we should count the cost is that when you're talking about changing your career, it's not just you as an individual impact. It can impact upon your family. 
So you need to make sure that you have the support of your family and network in whatever you choose um, to, to do. So say, for example, you want to become a nurse. This is a job that might require you to work shifts. It could be night shifts. Is your partner on board with that? Happy to look after the children when you go for your night shift? This is a question you need to ask. Are your children at the stage of their life where they are now self, a bit more self-independent? Like for, for my one, when I chose to go back to study again the second time, my children were grown up. And so I could go for evening classes. I could have my lectures in the evening because I know when they come back, they can sort themselves out, they can feed themselves. You need to make sure that you keep them part of your um, planning, count the cost with them so that if you need quite time, oh, look, I'm sorry, family, today I cannot cook because I have exams. They'll be willing to support you. It's not like you just went by yourself and you just chose to do something else. And then when people are not supporting you, you feel like you are on your own. So this is also very important. Then I'm going to talk about some important considerations in terms of your career. I know I've talked general, but one of the things that I think is very important is that we need to keep God in the conversation. You are not, God is the one that puts the gifts in you. And he's the one that knows what you're able to do. So you need to make sure that you are asking for his guidance and his direction in everything that you do. Um, Psalm 37 verse 3 to 5 says, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the, the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring you to pass. So we want to start on this career journey, seek the face of God first. You can seek him for direction, you can seek him for guidance. One of the things that I've learned recently is that in terms of our gifts and our talents, it can be used in many ways. But one thing that is certain is that, again, this was mentioned by the last speaker, and that's why I said it was one of my favorite scriptures. It says that his plans for us are of good, not of evil, that might come to an expected end. God wants you to succeed. So in you taking your plans to him, he wants the best for you. And in you going to him, he will direct you and lead you in the right path. The second thing that I would say is that you shouldn't compare yourself with others. Everybody's career different, um, career journey is different. And like I said in the beginning, God has deposited different skills in each and every one of us. So looking at A or B and seeing where they are in their career, or what they are doing, is not really going to help you. We're all called to do something different. I'm going to read Galatians 6.4. It says, pay careful attention to your own work for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. Where Mr. B or Mrs. B is in their career, to God be the glory, that is where they are. This is where, and this is the direction God has planned for me and I will run with it and I will focus on my work and I will get satisfaction of a job well done. The other thing that we, we don't know when we look and we compare ourselves with others is we don't know how their journey started, how they got there. You don't know the pains they have been through. All you're seeing is the finished results. And you're like, oh, today I want to be with someone who maybe spent 15 years of their life dedicating themselves to what they are doing to get to where they are. The um, Second Corinthians 12, uh, 10, 12 tells us that we shouldn't be fools and compare ourselves with others the way other people do. Another reason I'll say why it's not good for you to compare people is that you don't even know the methods some people use to advance their careers. Some people might have done things fraudulently to get to where they are, and there you are, you're admiring them and wanting to um, be like them. There was a story a few years back of a CEO who was stripped of his position because it was found out that he got to where he was um, using fake results. So you're looking at that person and you're like, oh, wow, I want to be like them. But the best was stripped at the pinnacle of their career, the shame and the disgrace. Where would he start from? So don't look at someone else. The, the Bible also tells us in Proverbs 37 that we should rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes to harm, um, harm. It says we should wait on the Lord. And as we wait on him, God will bring our desires to pass in Jesus' name. The other thing that we need to note in terms of um, doing our jobs is that we all have different 
ability. So we shouldn't look up or look down on others. I might have the ability to be a successful lawyer because of the gifts God has placed in me. And you might have the ability to be a successful chef. So don't look down on someone because they are lower or we feel we are better than them. The reverse is also the case where we despise people because they are more successful than us. There's a, if we look at the story of the, um, look at the story, sorry. Sorry, I think um, Elsa is trying to get my attention. Elsa, did you want to say something? I hope you can still hear me. Time. Okay, Time. yeah, I'm, I'm rounding up now, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done, I'm just rounding up, yeah. The other thing we need to do is that in terms of our jobs, um, just be happy with who you are. Zachariah 4, 10. Sorry, it talks about, um, I've, I've lost my place. Yeah, don't despise humble beginnings. God is the one that can lift you up. And in James 4.10, we're also told that when we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will make us great. Last I'll say, age is not a barrier. Don't feel that I'm too old. I can't do anything. I have, there's someone that's a friend to me and she started her nursing career in her 40s. And at the moment, she has completed her nursing career and she's actually doing very well. So don't let age be a barrier for you to accomplish. Thank you. I'm so sorry for taking more time. Any comments and questions, I will hand over back to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, we learned so much. Uh, one thing that Nikke can bear, Nikke, if you are there, you know they say, um, a lot of things we don't think of. Well, project management, when you're uh, training to be a project manager, part of the things they tell you is that working at home and you do projects in the house as a wife or as a mom, you are planning a trip. That is a uh, project management experience. A lot of us don't see all these transferable um, skills from the time we spent at home. So while it can seem like a lost time, we, if we can gather all the experiences. I've seen people that Nikia, can you remember? I don't know whose resume we saw where the person put um, for a certain period. Uh, I think it's a co worker where we work that. Um, um, she was a mom for 10 years. Yes. She's taking care of her father, right? Mm -hmm. That's what she yeah, did on her something resume. Something like that for almost yes. 10 years. Uh, primary care for um, her dad. Yes, she put it on her resume and she got a job. So um, all those are transferable skills. I want to thank everybody that is still here. Now we, we are rounding up. Thanks for the patient uh, for patiently waiting with us. I know that um, you know, we, we packed so much. We wanted to give like a power pack in the uh, power punch in the time we had, but we had so many um, speakers and so much. I also took time. So please just bear with us. We'll be rounding up in a few minutes. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Uh, we're just gonna to go to QA and A, and I'm gonna show you our resource page because um uh, we want to promote people that do businesses. All these people, nobody paid for this. It's all free. So I'll start with myself. Hey, you know, self-promotion, you know, like you say, shameless plug. My books are here. Um, uh, this is a, uh, these are all the books I've written. All these are children books, but this one is for women. Uh, my social media pages. And this is Pastor Kenny Akins. She's written, in fact, she has a new book that came out. Instead of called Men No Pause, she said Me No Pause, meaning she separated the word me. Then the next two letters, no, and the next one's pause, meaning she does, she's not going to pause regardless of age. Uh, she has a book, The 3D Woman, Bulletproof, 45 Music. She, she has an album, and this is a social media platform. You see, she's power packed. And um, skincare with Dami, Dami that spoke with us. You can shop in our body shop here. These are our face, um, social media handles. Elizabeth Garcia, she's one of the sponsors of our gifts. Somebody's gonna get two of these. If you're interested in Herbal Life, um, the first two people that sent, she's gonna send you two packages for free. The first two people that send Herbal Life to Nike, she's gonna uh, collect your information so Elizabeth can send you this. It has, um, um, like shakes you can use for different things if you want to manage your weight. So this is a sample here. Then Golden Boutique and Kitchen, if you want to buy, if you're local in the US, I'm sure they do 
and delivery within the US, please contact Wura. We can get your jewelry. I actually got this bracelet from her, coincidentally. And you can get your um, African food stuff from her. King's Place International. This is by a friend I know. She has a children's bookstore in Nigeria. She's had it for over 10 years. Actually, more, maybe way more than that. So please patronize her. If you want to get books, she gets books from different parts of the world for children. There's wholesale food store. If you want to buy your wholesale food store, you can contact Dale if you're local in Nigeria. And we have a book by one of our sisters, Chidimai Okolo. It's Understanding the Concept of Love in Marriage. Oh, sorry, um, there's someone. Let me try and mute whoever that is. Anyways, understanding the concept of um, love in marriage, you can uh, order your book on Amazon. We have Just Unique Hair. She uh, specializes. It's, uh, most of these businesses, are, I think they are all owned by women. And um, uh, they sell 100% premium quality virgin hair. So that's the beautiful hair there sample. And Oliver into Innovations, I've known her for a while. She's into IT. Before IT became what it is, she's been into IT. Thank you very much. So just a few minutes. We're going to take just a few minutes for Q&A. You can go back to, you can click the interactive session and you should have a page here like this. This, you can go in and type your question here and it's going to pop up here. So we already have some questions here. Uh, you guys can go in and vote on the most, the one you want to hear the most. But I'm going to ask a question and any of our panelists can please answer. The first question says, can a single woman adopt a child? Nikkei, after this, I'm handing it over to you. So the first question is, can a single woman adopt a child? Um, any of our panelists, or does anyone want to say something real quick? Nikkei, over to you. Okay, I've not been able to go into the um, AFAV website. Oh, I can hear you. Am I sharing my screen? Yes. I just started sharing. Oh my goodness. So I went through all these businesses. Anyway, you can see all the businesses on this page. I'm not sure if I was sharing it before. I hope I was. You no, well, I know this. Yeah. All right. No, thank you. Did. All right. So please. Can someone who wants to answer? Uh, let me ask um, Minister. I don't know if Mr. Edna Idehe is still on the line or Pastor Kenny Akins. Both. Uh, I know uh, Edna, you're into marriage. Can a single woman adopt a child? Because I know because um, a lot of us they'll tell you, oh, to you're married, don't have children, and all that. Can a single woman adopt a child? Um. Well, I would just say that depends on which region this person is. I know adoption rules vary from one um, place to the other, but I know in the US, yes, a single mom can adopt a child. But I would, so, uh, so do you think, it's, is this something that you say that um, if maybe a woman is getting older in age, do you see, and she wants to adopt, so you don't see anything wrong in that, right? Um, that's a different, different issue. Personally, um, I believe that anybody can adopt a child and whether you, whatever age you're at, whether you're even bearing children of your own and you feel led to adopt. I mean, we used to do it back home, except that we didn't give it that name. We would pick up an uncle's child or a sister's child to add to us, to raise along with us. And some people did such a good job of it that those children still call their mother till today or, you know, so um, it, it, I don't think the age should limit you to adopt it and just look into your particular region and see the rules that apply. Esther was adopted by the cousin Mordecai and he raised her as his own. So um, I don't see anything wrong with adoption. All right. Thank you. So this is just for maybe those that are um, advancing and in every stage of life, stage phase, and, and uh, I'll say particularly to a single woman, maybe you're older in age and you're wondering if adoption is for you. If if it's going to give you fulfillment, to you've always had a desire to raise a child, I'll say please go ahead. Do not hold yourself back, and I will recommend that you get a support system, a good support system that will help you along your journey. All right, 
Um, Nikkei, I guess, do you want me to continue? So, so I think we have five questions. And from the five questions, we, uh, we have um, number one, number two, and number three. So number one has been answered. I think the next one is how can I, oh, I think the, are the boarding still coming in? How can I get myself back into work after having children? Um, I don't know. Pat, can you help us answer that question real quick? Thank you. I think she's answered some of it, but yeah, you can answer I, I was going to say, sorry, I was going to say, I think I did mention it, but I'm just seeing all the comments now because I was sharing my screen. I couldn't really um, see. So yeah, you. it's about whether you have skills and experience, what do you want to do? And how do you want to get there? I think there's this saying that um, if you don't know where you want to go, you won't know how you get there. So what do you want to do? And then you need to check and see what do you need to get there? Do you need skills, experience, training? Do you have any? And how will it impact on your family overall? Are they willing to support you on the journey? So I think there's a lot that comes into that um, question. You just need to be true to yourself and check where you are and what you need to do to get to where you want to be. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. I hope that has been answered. And the next question is, women especially don't like talking to a therapist for the fear of being labeled. How can you trust the therapist that they have your interest at heart? Uh, maybe Dr. Fumi or Dr. Ekins. I just stay on the line. Hi. Um... I believe, well, therapists do have your best interests at art, but I think if you're going to find a therapist, I think you should take into consideration everything about you. So as Christian women, I would say, take into consideration religion. Um, so, because there are some things you will, that affects the way you think. So um, I believe you should put that into consideration when looking for somebody that you want to talk to. Um, yes. But I can say on that topic, um, thera therapists are trained to have your best interests at heart. And if you find that, if you find that you're talking to somebody and you think they don't have your best interests at heart, you have the <laughs> ability to leave and find somebody else. That's one thing that is good about being here in the US, you can always move and find somebody else and find another therapist until you find somebody that you're comfortable with. And also putting God in, in the midst and praying while before you choose a therapist, before you choose somebody that you talk to. So um, that's what I, I thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Fumi. Uh, I've actually seen somebody who fired her gynecologist. So. <laughs> I chose somebody else. <laughs> I don't know if I can add a quick word there. You can, ma'am. We have the opportunity to research the therapies, look them up, you know, and um, there's information available on each of them, you know, look them up. I know that will give you just the limited uh, information, but maybe you see that their uh, practice is built up because there are so many different areas in therapy. You might just look at the person and, you know, from that, you know, this is not what I'm looking for. Some people specialize in rape cases, for example, mm -hmm. some in family crisis, some PTSD, you know, just different areas. And when you search like that, you kind of narrow it down. Of course, putting into consideration the other things that uh, Sister Fumi mentioned. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your input. Um, the, we have two more questions. How, how do we as women unravel the mystery of two become one in our relationship with our spouse? Is, is that possible? Um, I don't know. Yeah, you can answer it. So you can answer it, ma'am. Yeah, you can. Relationship, yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, when I look at this question, I think about for two to become one. The Bible says that except a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abideth alone. 
you know, and also another part of the scripture says they were both naked and they were not ashamed. So that whole process of two becoming one in, in, in marriage, it takes time, but you must start with trust and being able to open yourself up. You know, some people stay married for 30 years, 50 years, and they are still two separate beings. <laughs> the process of becoming one did not even start because of lack of trust or not opening themselves up. There's still some parts of them that they are hiding, you know? So I would say trust is, is fundamental and then being naked and not ashamed. Um, that's very important. And if you started the marriage off, you know, marrying after, after God's heart, you're not married like a, a Christian going to marry an unbeliever. You know, even though Christians still have problems in marriage, but at least you have a common reference point and you're all looking at what does God say about this. So those are some of the tips I have to say. Thank you, Ma. And the last question in the chat says, how do you start building for the vision God has given you when you are a student? How do you confirm the means of how God wants you to pursue the vision? Dami, can you help us answer that question, please? Dami. Um, I, I think uh, being a student, that's a great place to have that uh, student mentality that I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, in my church, for example, we have a lot of people who they've gone around like either the camera, the media group. So they're going around giving their input on this uh, level. You might not have a big platform right now, but there's so many ways as a student that you can um, let your vision, uh, let God's vision for you to um, showcase itself, either volunteering in places, um, have young adults who are also into YouTube and all of those things. You, if it's um, something where you have something to say, you want your voice to be heard, you can use different platforms. You can start a podcast, but it depends on what the vision is. If you've already found what God is saying about you, then that's that's the first step. That's the big step. But the how, um, mentorship, you can get asked questions from people who are older as well. So people that have been through what you've uh, done, uh, you can ask them for ideas and you can also use the resources that you have. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, you can share your voice on those platforms in a different way, I think. Uh, Thank you so much, Anne. I think we've come to the end of the Q&A section. If we don't have any more questions, I'll yield my time back to Sister Elza. Thank you. Oh, Nikkei, oh, okay, let me not say Nikkei. Dami, before you go off the line, can you choose one more number so we can give out a gift uh, to someone? Um, well, what's the number? How many people do we have? One, two. What's the last? Number? We have one to 81. Okay, um, 73. <laughs> That's the Omoye Belo. I don't know if you're on the line. Omoye Yemen Belo. You got the That's last piece. Very interesting. He's a friend of mine that uh, joined in from Nigeria. That's very uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll look forward to get her a gift. Maybe we'll send her a gift from Pastor Kenny, uh, one of her books. All right. Thank you, everyone. We've, that, we've come to the end. Oh, Nikki, is there anything else we're missing? Um, we're not missing anything. I think everybody had done tremendously well. I just want because, I, okay, so when I, when the, the online school started. I learned a lot from my five-year-old pre-K class. When they do something very good, the teacher will tell them to kiss their brains. So <laughs> I want everybody to kiss them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we all did well. Thank you so much for the knowledge. Thank you for your time. You know, it was great. I'm really blessed. And I'm sure we each and every one of us, we are all blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we are going to be having polls. You can visit uh, the site back. Uh, the resource page would be changed to a polling page where you can provide feedback, please, about how the conference was. So we're going to be changing the um, page. Once we are done um, 
you can come back and please give your feedback. In the meantime, you can annotate, please go on your screen. If you see the whiteboard, you can write anything you want to write on the screen, how you feel about today, what you learned. Just you can write, just go on your screen. Uh, just say happy. Uh, for example, you can just write something. Just uh, just have fun. Can you all annotate on the screen? Are you able to? Let me make let me make it um all right. I think you should be able to do that now. You can go ahead, write on your white the white screen. You can write on the whiteboard, just go on your Zoom screen and annotate. I can only see me writing. <laughs> Where is he? Uh, yeah, I can see someone writing now. Just write something, just to know that you're still here. I had so much, so much fun. Thank you. So I can see everybody writing. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's just something to have fun. And uh, we officially closed. And um, I just want to just give a, I just want to appreciate everyone that attended. At some point, we were um, um, 80 something people on the line. Thank you. People from different parts of the world. I just want to appreciate everyone. I'm going to stop the annotation. I, I just want to appreciate everyone for attending, spending hours with us online. Next time, we'll, I know we, uh, we, we took a long time because, like I said, we had a, a group of very powerful speakers. I just want to appreciate everyone that spoke. Let me start with, um, uh, if I want to start, I'm going to start with, um, I'll just tell you real quick, um, sorry, before we round up. Let me go back to the events page. I've known Minister Edna for over 10 years. I've known Minister Patience for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. I've known Pastor Kenny Akins for over um, 16 years. I've known Fumi for over 10 years. Dami, I think I've known her for about five years. I've known myself well for a while. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> I'm still finding out myself. I've known Nikke for, I think since 2013. Yeah, it seems like forever, you know, we just keep popping up at the same place. I just want to appreciate everybody. If you want to stay and hang out, please, if you can unmute, put yourself on camera. Let's see everyone. Let me stop sharing my screen. Put yourself on camera. Uh, yeah, please help us to um, 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 uh, give a hand to, the, to all the people that presented. Please go ahead. Uh, let me take myself as... Um, Thank you so much, everyone. I learned a lot, a lot, a lot. Thank you. God Thank bless you. you all. Thank you. So I want to see all the beautiful faces. Thank you, Thank you very much for taking. Today is a beautiful day here in Charlotte. So after it's been raining and you decided to hang out, um, um, you know, uh, we, you start, decided to hang out um, um, here with us. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. If you want to hang out and say hi, you can, but we are officially done. But in summary, I just want to remind everyone, for those of us that were not here when we started, that God sees you as you. Uh, whether or not you are a parent, um, I think I put the spotlight on you, Nikia. So let me remove it. <laughs> I don't even know how to take it off. Let me take it back. Uh, sorry. Anyway, God sees you as you, uh, regardless of whatever age, stage, or phase in life you are in. God sees you as you. God has a purpose for you. He didn't just create you to say, hmm, you're going to be this person's mother and that's all, or you're going to be this person's wife, that's all. He sees you as you. And I just want to remind you that God loves you. And um, um, it doesn't matter what situation you're going through. God loves you and is thinking about you. And you are, you, are the, you are the apple of his eyes. You are the sugar of his tea. You are everything to him. So don't forget that regardless of what you're going through, what makes a woman complete is just remembering who she is in God and live your life like that. In Jesus, we live and move and have our being. Thank you very much. Have a blessed week, weekend and everything. Thank you. Mm. You too. All bye -bye. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Oh, Sister Nike, congratulations. Yes, I didn't even know you were pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, congratulations, I, Sister Nike. I'm like, Thank one you. month, baby. I didn't even hear <laughs> anything. Right here. Wow. wow. Congratulations. Miracle. Please. <laughs> Sister Ron, you're good to see you. Yeah, same here. <laughs>
It's a nigga can one more time. Oh, yes, it's a Raju. Congrats, oh, many more, many more. Good job, Nikki. Yes, ma'am. Sister Amanda, hi. Thanks for being here all day. Nikki, George, Sarah, Diana, Abigail, iPad, Musola, Lawa, Galaxy 10 Notes. We were all up for you. For inshallah, doing solar. The, the uh, baby uh, everybody, I'm just telling everybody. everybody. And Allison, Diana, are they doing Yeti? Patience, can they do solar? The baby is ready for another baby. No, yes. no. I'm just congratulating you for the baby that has grown to get another baby. <laughs> Yeah, Janet, Lola, Sophia, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye. We recorded everything so you can watch it. But come back to this the resource. Bye. Page. Sister Elsa. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. Sister Elsa. Yeah. Okay, Elsa. That was a power package program. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That I appreciate awesome. you. And I'm mm. glad I'm part of it. Thank More you. I love you. you thank you. I appreciate you. Appreciate Everybody, you. thank you. The speaker, you. the attendees, thank you so much. Thank Drop you. Yes. Thank you, Pastor Kenny, um, Sister Edna, Pepe, uh, Dr. Fumi, Dami. I called on you all, and you guys just said yes. God bless you. God bless you, real good. This is just the base. Greater things to come. I'm still Amen. here waiting for everybody to go. I'm not, I'm not sending you away. Please stay if you want to hang out. I'm still here. Sister <laughs> Anne, Allison, God bless you. I saw Sister if you uh, even log in while at work in her uh, in her protective gear. God bless you. Sister Vicky and Victoria, God bless you. Okay, we are counting down the same way we counted up. Sophia, Queen Shola, Abigail. In fact, I just thank God. Uh, my sisters and I, we were online on Thursday trying to troubleshoot things. Nikia with her baby, she's been here since morning. I'm sure your son will be mad at me now. <laughs> <laughs> He's good. <laughs> thank you. Sister Edna, thanks to Brother Fred. He was here online this morning trying to help me troubleshoot things. Thank you. Pepe, thank you. Bye-bye. Jumping from one program to another, to back and forth. Thank you. I learned a lot. <laughs> Because it's true. Sometimes while we are going through that age of waiting, we, we forget mm. that all those things are experiencing. Yeah, it was Yvonne. Um, um, Nikia is Yvonne yeah, that Yvonne. started her sk- resume. That she was spending time taking care of her father. And they gave her the job. So thank you. Okay. How many of us left online? 14. 14. Okay, 14 people. Okay, let's have a party. Where's the food? <laughs> Grab your water. Where's the food? <laughs> Where's the food? Virtual. Okay, hold on. Let me send something in the chat. <laughs> Please don't send something that we can't eat. Ah, uh, no. Because I'm going to be mad at you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. It was everybody. wonderful. I will yeah. watch the recording because I Thank missed you. out on the um, beginning part, but it was interesting to see that um, some of the themes were reoccurring. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think next time we'll do it maybe on a, a like stretch two days because somebody asked me, I think it was Pastor Kenny, he said, how many days? I said, it's one. But you know, it's hard to get people. Maybe it's, it would have been easier to get people at two hours, six, two hours, tw- um, yeah. two hour interval twice. But um, thank God. Well, it's a start yeah, of it was, I just wanted to say thank you for the program so much. I wasn't able to attend the full program, but I thought it was very insightful. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And your name, please. Hi. I only see you as E. Oh, my name is Esther Alalo. Oh, Esther, thank you very much. God bless you. Oh, and yeah, I forgot. People that want free coaching, you know what, uh, Nikia, we're going to, I'll just do an email blast. People that want free coaching, then all the gifts. Uh, just <laughs> let me know. <laughs> I forgot. The free coaching to 86 people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, two people that want free coaching. Sorry, two people oh, two that want one. free coaching. Okay, yeah. two. Okay, yeah, I have two. So we'll do that. Two free coaching sessions, and uh, we didn't even talk about other events. We didn't even talk about tutoring, but that's fine. It's you know, fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah. Well, there there was there was a lot that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you yeah. so much. Oh, thank, thank you, Pastor Kenny. Look at how she. If you see her children, they're all grown. Ooh. <laughs> Yes, big, big, or 20-something. Yeah. Wow. Your, your, your daughter is 20-something now, right? Yeah, she's 22. 22, wow. yeah. Mm, thank you. Thank you. I thank really you. was really very, very enlightening. Thank you so much. You did a great job. 
Thank you very and, um, much. Amazing attendance, great speakers. Yeah. Great and things ahead. Good coordination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I'm sure it's almost midnight in Nigeria now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no. Exaggeration. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye. All right. Bye. While we're in the morning, she was greeting good evening. Thank you. All right. Okay, well, Nikki, I'm waiting for you. Uh -huh. Abigail and uh, Sophia are still online. Abigail, Sophia, Joy. This is Joy. Your Joy? Still. Yeah, I think yes. Oh. <laughs> She's watching with grandma. Oh, okay. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you, Abigail. Oh, your same sister. Yes, yeah. oh, that, I think okay. you didn't see me care. Oh, she has gone off. Oh, she's gone. Yeah, I'll tell her you say seeing her. Yeah, hey, well done, though, Nike. God bless you. Ah, you, 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 you do call, well, six, six million people will answer in Jesus. Good, call, hey, man, good coordination, yeah. And yeah. at least now we know what to do better next time. Next time, I, yes. I, I, I knew that I gave people two short times to, to talk, we we'll have less, so I think it's better. Now. Yeah, all right, God bless. Well, it worked out well. Yeah, we thank God. Mm. Oh, somebody just logged in. Can you imagine? Hi, uh -oh. Rachel. Uh, someone called Rachel Mastaki just logged in. <clears throat> okay. All right. I think maybe all the other people are not here, actually. The eight people, it's just both of oh me, I'm here how many times? So. Okay, I'm, you're like three or so, two. Mm -hmm, three. Joy, three. Me, four. Mm, yeah. Okay, let me end. Let me end it.